Animals and pests. <clears throat> Insects, spiders, and ticks. Best way to avoid any bites from in any insects, spiders, or ticks are wear long pants, socks, and long sleeve. Use insect repellent con containing DEET. Treat bites and stings with over-the-counter products. <clears throat> Be aware of all venomous and dangerous animals, including fire ants or black widows. Nothing that we have to think of here. Avoid fire ants when they finally get up here. Um, there are such, you know, fire ants and black widows. It just continues. They are dangerous. Any allergies or med medical conditions that require use of an EpiPen in an event of an insect sting or others should be noted by fellow workers. I always have one in the truck. Anytime I have somebody on my team that requires an EpiPen, I have them give me an extra one. So I always have it on me. Four, animals and pests. Watch where you place your hands and feet when removing debris. Um, especially, you know, if you are cleaning out a bioswale in the summertime, there may be sunning snakes, etc. Not that we have to really worry about our snakes in our area. Note the venomous snakes and species. <clears throat> if you see a snake, step back. Wear boots 10 inches high. Watch for snakes on fallen trees, limbs, and debris. Snakes can strike about half their total length. If bitten, note the color sh and shape of the snake. Keep bite victims still, calm. <clears throat> Slow the spread of the venom in case the snake is venomous. Seek medical attention. Do not cut the wound or attempt to suck out the venom. Apply first aid. Lay the person down so that the bite is below the level of the heart. And keep the bite clean with dry dressing. Dead and live animals can spread disease such as rat bite fever and rabies. Avoid contact with wild and stray animals. Avoid contact with rats and rat contaminated buildings. If you cannot avoid contact with rats and rat contaminated buildings, wear protective gloves, wash your hands regularly. Get rid of dead animals as soon as possible. If bitten or scratched, get medical attention. Any questions on animal safety? Okay. Potential hazards. Placing equipment too close or structures too close that could uh, threaten the integrity, um, buildings, infrastructures, vibration, weather conditions, all of which can change the uh, conditions of a trench. Piling soil and equipment too close to a trench can cause a collapse. One cubic so yard of soil can weigh as much or more than a car. Two workers killed every month in trench collapse. Divert water away from open trenches and expect trench walls. This just, you know, in light of recent news and everything, this is something that often, I guess, gets overlooked. Water erodes and changes the soil conditions over time. Protect, protection systems must be used when excavating. Excavation is more than a four foot depth. Cave in protection is required when excavations are made is not required when they're made entirely in stable rock. Trench protective systems include sloping or bending trench walls, cutting or creating strep, uh, stepped bench grades, shoring trench walls with supports, posts, jacks, beams, hydraulic jacks, shielding trench walls with trench boxes. All excavated material needs to be placed at least two feet from the edge of the trench. That is probably the number one violation I see all the time. Um, and it actually even shows up in some of the example pictures that you will see in this slideshow. <clears throat> excavated material should not block sidewalks or streets. Safety precautions while working near or in excavation. Inspect the trench at the start of the shift and as needed throughout the workday when conditions change. Provide safe entry and exit through the use of ladders, ramps, stairways within 25 we feet of workers in the trench.
Heat stress, types of heat stress, heat exhaustion or heat stroke. <clears throat> Risk factors, high temperatures, humidity, direct sun exposure, no breeze or wind, low liquid intake, heavy physical labor, waterproof clothing, <clears throat> no recent exposure to hot workplaces. Symptoms of heat exhaustion are headache, dizziness or fainting, weakness, wet skin, irritability or confusion, thirst, nausea or vomiting. Symptoms of heat stroke, confusion, inability to think clearly, passing out, collapsing, having a seizure, sweating stops. How to protect yourself from heat stress. Know the signs and the symptoms. Moder monitor yourself. Use a buddy system, block out direct sun and other heat sources, drink plenty of fluids, drink often, and before you think you are thirsty, <clears throat> drink water every 15 minutes, avoid beverages containing alcohol or caffeine, drink beverages that replace electrolytes, wear <clears throat> lightweight, light colored, loose fitting clothing. Cold stress. Hypothermia <clears throat> is when the body temperature drops to 95 or less. Frostbite is when the body tissue freezes, hands, feet, <clears throat> and can occur above freezing due to wind chill and may result in amputation. Trench foot, non-freezing injury caused by exposure to cold, wet environments can occur as a high as 60 degrees. Risk factors, improper dress, wet clothing or skin, exhaustion. Symptoms of hypothermia, <clears throat> alert but shivering. Moderate symptoms, you stop shivering, confusion, slurred speech, heart rate and breathing slows, loss of consciousness or death. Symptoms of frostbite, numbness, red skin, develops white patches, feels firm and hard, may blister. Symptoms of trench foot, redness, swelling, numbness, blisters. How to protect yourself from cold stress. Know the symptoms. Monitor yourself from cold workers. Drink warm liquids, but not alcohol. Dress properly. <clears throat> Layers of loose fitting, insulating clothing. Insulated jackets, gloves, hats. Waterproof if necessary. Insulated waterproof boots. Does anybody have any questions about safety? No? Okay. One of these days. Well, actually, we did. Joe, get, Joe hit us up with one question. This was the, the first time I ever had a question during safety. So, Joe, thank you. I appreciate that. And I feel bad that I did not have the perfect answer for you. But I appreciate getting the perfect answer. Well, well, well Trevor, if it makes you feel any better, <clears throat> you know, it's we have a couple of people who've already been EMTs, I believe, in here. So, you know, that's we want to engage, but, you know you're engaging um you know what guys i mean i have to say like that is the next to like the opening this is what the program is about that is the hardest one to deliver i i find very few opportunities or places to make jokes or make that humorous or make that exciting so i really i really did give you my best so i that's that's, that's okay you want to hear a point of fact though we do have copperheads um in western mass so we do have poisonous snakes. We do have poisonous snakes. Yes. Okay. I forgot where I forgot who I was talking to. <laughs> we also have rattlesnakes as well. Do we see those though? Uh, in the Quabbin area, you do see them. Okay. Um, they they had one who used to be outside my house every morning in Pelham. You'd walk out and hear the. And you're going, oops, don't want to find you. We have them in the Berkshires as well. Okay. So, I mean, I knew that we, I knew of our venomous snakes in this area, but like, is it something that like, if you guys are out working, like, are you consciously re readily aware of, I, and this is just for me to know, because I just figured they were just so into the woodlands and everything else that yes, if you were hiking, you saw them, but like when you were doing your day-to-day -day activities, it probably wasn't a thing. There's only one good kind of snake. Oh yeah, a garter snake? A non-existent one. <laughs> well, I think it depends on a habitat, like if you're working in an area and you would know because you'd have to go through all kind of permitting because of the habitat restrictions there. 
Like I yeah. think of the water tower on Mount Tom that East Hampton maintains. If they ever do some work there, it's rattlesnake territory. No kidding. All right. And there are definitely like it's certain towns, um, you know, Belchertown, we are all sorts of mountainous and trees everywhere, even with homes. So sometimes, you know, it, it depends if you're going out into the field, into lots of woods, or if you're on the side of the road, whether you got to be prepped. All right. Well, that was awesome because now I stand corrected and that's, that's fine. That's fine by me. I knew if, I guess, you know, out of all the groups that I've taught, I knew if any group was going to teach me something new, it was going to be this group. So, all right. I will and never say again, we do not have to worry about snakes. <laughs> but I figured, you know, you know, we're listening, we're engaging, you know, like, because you poor thing, you're up there all by yourself. So. No, no, it's it's definitely all good. And I, like I said, I, I appreciate that because, you know, like I said, while I know of their existence, I really did not think that we ever had to take into consideration. When I was giving this talk down in Austin, hell yeah, that was like a thing. We talked about, I got a whole schooling on fire ants and, and all, everything Ooh. under the sun. So I just, <laughs> I never, I've never felt threatened up here. So I've seen some big ass snakes up here, but I've never felt threatened. So now we've given you a new complex, is what you're saying, Trevor. Well, now I know just not to go running willy nilly all around the all around the state, <laughs> jamming my hands everywhere. <clears throat> all right, site management. So we'll do site man. Well, yeah, we'll do site management. See where that takes us, and then we'll be getting into bioretention. <clears throat> okay, so the learning objectives critical site management goals, um, pr practices through construction and operation, identify the goals of erosion and sediment control, identify survey layout markers. Again, some of this is gonna be basic for some of you who do this all the time. Uh, identify site management activities to improve safety, and identify ways to manage stockpiled materials. That's something that I do kind of go off on. Uh, especially around green infrastructure. Describe how activation compaction can occur on a GI site and when it's wanted and when it's not. Explain the fundamentals on how to read and use site plans, <clears throat> section drawings, etc. Site management goals. Okay. The basics. Construction document, site plans. Site plans are what to build. They provide the geographical description of the construction site and the elements of the site. <clears throat> the specifications or specs are how to build it. <clears throat> they provide a written detailed information on the materials used on the construction project, as well as proper techniques required for installation and construction. This is the piece right here where I usually find the, the first mistake because this is where the, the cut and paste starts to happen um, when a architect or whomever is designing uh, does not have all the information and or does not want to go searching the right information. They start to cut and paste and this is where the first little blunder usually occurs. This is kind of where my question comes in, I think, um, uh, okay. regarding um, the I brought it up the other day about getting the right contractors on these jobs, especially when they're mixed in with other contractors. Do you usually put, like, have you seen, um, like, pre-qualifications in the front end or something that um, require, you know, someone to have experience with green infrastructure install? Um, I know I know now, I've, I've seen now, and I know now that there are RFPs going out requiring this certification, that there are RFPs going out, um, you know, th that, that are going out requiring, you know, some sort of knowledge or um, proof of understanding of, of, these, of these practices and, and of these ideas. Yeah, because I just see a lot like, I mean, maybe we do a couple of green infrastructure, straight green infrastructure projects, but I, I see a lot of these projects being part of a larger project, like a street project where like we're doing pipe install. And like you said, people doing pipe install or road work regrading, all that have a different skill set. And 
um, just trying to work that into the bid so we're not just getting uh, uh, someone who installs water pipes and you know replaces the road you know that they maybe have a subcontractor on their group that does the green infrastructure like just trying to formulate the bids correctly so we're getting the right people installing these these systems no absolutely so that's where when i'm not doing this if i <laughs> if i'm not doing this and i'm not consulting that's where uh, up until this really the majority of my business was that's what i did so and it was usually around permeable, permeable and porous pavement <clears throat> So a contractor would be hired to, for instance, I'm, I'm bidding a job in Salem right now that has a few thousand square feet of pervious pavement to be installed. So the contractor calls me, says, give me a bid on this. Um, another one in Melrose, it's a park, same kind of thing. Porous pavement going in. They said, hey, we're installing this, this new park. You know, we'll take care of all the grading. We'll take care of all the, you know, all the planting and the site prep, et cetera. Can you just come in and do the pervious pavement part? So I think for us, uh, like we, I'm just seeing like, cause we just, like I said, we go by bids and then like, unless they're not qualified, it basically goes to the lowest bidder. So it's like directing the people to people like you or other contractors that, that specialize in it, that I think that I just have to get my head around how to put that in the specs and make sure that happens. Well, and that's the, that's the hardest part. And I've actually been working. It's one of the things I'm talking about the EPA with. I've also talked with the, um, the MVP program when they're, when they're give when they're putting out, when they're putting out their bids, because here's the thing like government EPA or, and the MVP, the people who handle the grants, they can't say, Hey, call Trevor Smith. He'll be more than happy to oversee the insight of it. So it's, finding out how we can compile a list so that you can, and this is, this is like the only way that I, that I know right now is because anybody, anybody who's taken my class and anybody who gets certified then is searchable on the national database. You go on to NGICP, you put in your location, you're going to find everybody in Massachusetts who has the certification. But the problem is it's like government can't say, you know, call this company. Call exactly. this, you know, and that's so that's where there's a problem. That being said, where specialty skills are needed, someone like you needs to be able to find a list of no, and know where to start. Find a list or just be able to like require, like you said, require certification. But if not enough people have the certification, you run into an issue there. Like just be able to direct um, us to or direct the contractors to where they need to go or how they need to be looking at it and not just from like this is green infrastructure do it <laughs> kind no, of thing I, I agree. they don't they don't always you know read through all the spec you know it's just you know we want to get the, these built correctly so. no absolutely and and that's and you know part of it is and which i'm i'm very happy and 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 grateful that you you know that you said that because part of it is realizing that this doesn't necessarily fall in the purview of general construction or the or construction that we're used to yeah exactly you know so i mean normal stormwater construction this is actually a you know a cousin of normal you know general stormwater you know construction and roadways and pipes and yeah stuff. it is and it isn't because i mean when you're putting in a catch basin you want a good solid foundation for that catch basin so it's like i think that a pipe contractor knows how to put a catch basin and a drain pipe in Yes, exactly. <laughs> so, so, I mean, yeah, so you definitely don't in the specs. Other, otherwise, you're going to have to go with the lowest bid, and you have to be yeah. how you write your specs, because you know, unless it's in there, you're going to get what you get. If it's a site contractor that does grading and stuff, they can follow this. So you'll you'll exactly. get in a procurement nightmare. It's, it's the bury, you just can't bury it in the specs either, like under, you know, like that green infrastructure section. I feel like it needs to be more in the front end section where the contractors are really delving in while they're putting their bid together. Yeah, the part that they're paying attention to? Yeah, especially when they're putting a bid together. A lot of times they're just looking at, okay, what's required in the front end and what are the materials required for this? Like that's all they're really looking at at that point. Yeah. No, totally. And, you know, I, it, I, it does, it's going to require, like, it's going to require change. And that's where, 
everything sucks. It's gonna require you maybe having to write in a line that you didn't have to write in before. And it's going to require contractors maybe having to read and think differently or sub differently when they could do it all in house. Maybe now they have to sub, you know, and that, that may all be irritating until there's, an, you know, until there's enough of this. You know, if you if, look at it like the vaccine, it's like right now there's only so many people vaccinated. Pretty soon there's gonna be enough people vaccinated that it'll be easy and it'll just be business as usual. It's, it's kind of the same thing. There are certified professionals out there. I know I've been cranking them out. Um, they are all over the state. Um, however, many of them are actually out of state um, and figuring out how to do a list that doesn't, doesn't violate kind of any, anybody's, anybody's standard or, you know, or, you know, exclude anybody, um, you know, is a thing. The lowest bidder, that's, that's my, that's always been my absolute nightmare. That's why I haven't done even half the green infrastructure work that I, that I bid on, because I will never be, you know, the lowest bidder. That's, you know, it's just the way, that's the way it is. And that's kind of the nightmare, you know, in, in my world. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so in site management and in reading site maps, you need to be familiar with contour lines, which are the lines that represent elevation. Ridge lines is the boundary between where the water flows in different directions, and the valley line is where the water collects. This is definitely relevant when you are looking at a watershed map. You need to be familiar with slope, uh, how to just how to read and understand slope. You don't need to be a master of slope, but um, for the for the exam, you should understand slope and in construction. As I was talking about the uh, bioswale built up slope, you should have an idea that water flows downhill. It will never flow uphill, at least not in these current conditions. So here you can see in the watershed map, you can see the ridge line where the water will flow in each direction. You can see the valley and the valley line where the water is going to collect and then leave the watershed. And as you were just talking about, Patty, you know, it's to me, it's just always what one of the things that brings water together is having to think about the Long Island Sound. You know, we feel like we're very far away from that. And so when you have to like consider <laughs> that, you know, consider that that's just kind of shows how land works, how water works and how we really have to all come together. And we can't think in our little silos and in our municipalities because our muni municipalities are only what they are. Our towns are only what they are because we said so. And in reality, they're a part of a much bigger picture. And we have to think about that bigger picture when we do things within our municipalities. Stormwater site plans consist of a title page, the site drawings, the plan view, which is the looking down on the plan, it includes a legend, explains what the symbols mean, the topography lines show the shape of the landscape, site location of the existing, uh, existing features, details for the building <clears throat> and proposed practices, erosion and sediment, sediment control practices to reduce the amount of sediment carried off site during construction. Stormwater site plans also consist of a cross section, a view of critical elements as seen if you cut across uh, the longitude profile, a view of critical elements as seen if you cut, as if you cut across and hold the whole thing in half, standard details, a close up view, of the practice to, con to clarify how to construct the element and the narrative of the project. Again, this is where some of the cut and paste comes in um, and things don't necessarily line up. You'll see, uh, you know, you'll see a cutaway or you'll see a description that doesn't necessarily match exactly what the overall description or is being, the, what's being attempted uh, in, in the practice itself. And then it becomes very obvious that somebody what didn't do their, their homework or their editing and they just did a copy and paste just to fill the page and to get it in there. And it's different for every project is different. There are some things that are the same, you know, but ultimately 
every single project is site specific. And that is one of the other things that excites some people and frustrates other people is that there isn't a silver bullet and there isn't just a one size fits all. Four, <clears throat> green infrastructure. You want to use the smallest equipment possible, which if you're looking at budgets, that's great because you don't want to have big equipment and you don't want to have to buy big equipment. You want to use the, the smallest equipment possible. However, sometimes large equipment is needed. For larger projects, you need larger equipment. <clears throat> During construction, you need to identify the critical root zone, which we had talked about. You need to preserve and maintain the existing vegetation as much as possible through the project um, phasing and construction sequence. You know, the, the existing trees and their root zones are very important. If you disregard the existing vegetation, those trees and root zones, it might be three years or so until that tree actually dies, but you will set that tree that has been there, you know, for years on a, on a slow decline if if you are not careful and if um, if things aren't properly handled. You also just need to um, look at the site and consider what is involved with the site. Sometimes stripping the entire site of all vegetation, especially if there's a slope involved. Um, knowing that you have, you know, a multi-month project in front of you isn't the best idea because then you will have multiple months of erosion happening on that site. And for as long as that vegetation's there, that's, that soil will be held in place. Protect the site from off-site stormwater flows, divert it around construction. <clears throat> prevent the construction activities from adding pollutants to stormwater. So if you have a strip site or construction happening and all that loose soil and all that construction debris washes out in, into the street and down the drain, that is polluting, uh, you know, polluting our stormwater and clogging our drains. Uh, again, if you, you know, if you strip the site or if you change, if you are changing the topography, make sure you understand how you are then changing the way water runs across the site. And you want to prevent the, um, the construction from increasing stormwater flows. Again, if you are taking down trees or removing vegetation, water is going to move a lot quicker across that site. Due to compaction during construction, water is going to move a lot quicker across that site. So you need to take all of that into consideration. Be able to identify the survey markers and make sure that they remain in place throughout construction. Identifying and locating utilities in the field <clears throat> can be a challenge. So just assume that you are going to bump into utilities or have to deal with utilities and uh, proceed with caution, but know that that is a thing. <clears throat> identify marked areas of high seasonal groundwater. I just had a long discussion on this uh, last week after our class uh, and what to do with high seasonal groundwater. Sometimes this will change what type of green infrastructure you are putting in. Cert sometimes, you know, high seasonal groundwater may eliminate a certain option as far as when we're looking for, I'd like to put this in or I'd like to do these things. Sometimes those are eliminated in high groundwater uh, areas. Or we have to change the overall size of our bioretention facility or whatever to accommodate for uh, high groundwater. <clears throat> Manage the site to protect construction materials prior to installation. Prevent soil from washing downstream into a stone pile. This is one of the biggest things. This is a thing that I'm a stickler on. You know, when you scrape all of that topsoil, that topsoil needs to go somewhere, but you need to protect that topsoil. Put a tarp over it and put sock around it to keep it from washing, uh, especially if you are working in say like a parking lot area. This was a big thing I had, I was all over. Uh, I was brought in to manage a, um, 
a bioswale installed down on Cape Cod and all the materials were being stored in the parking lot. But as it rained, you know, unprotected materials were just contaminating other materials as they just kind of flowed around the parking lot. So everything needs to be tarped and throw some sock around it to keep it from contaminating the other pieces. Also, it is important to, you know, logistically to bring the materials in when you need them. If you are working on a project, say it's, you know, say you're building a bioswale, you know, at the school. Well, if you are doing that, then there is, you may not need, if you do not need your, um, your constructed bioswale media until, you know, week six, don't bring it in on week two, because then you have all of that time for it to get contaminated with weed seeds, for it to erode, for something, you know, for something to happen. If you are bringing in stone and you have your topsoil or whichever, and you're bringing in your stone, but you don't need to bring in all of your other materials and have that around it. Wait until, you know, process each one if you can and try to just time your logistics to bring the materials in as you need it. So you don't have a massive stockpile of things because when you do, you run the risk of contaminating them. And things like gravel, if you want, you know, um, you want your GI system to be successful, you need to make sure that that gravel comes in clean and then that gravel remains clean for the, you know, for the extent of installation until it's in there and so it's in there and you want to be clean while it's in there. Uh, you don't want it to, you don't want to put, you know, all your gravel in and then have a rain event and then all the topsoil washes in, you know, to the gravel that you just placed. So it's, it's important. This too aggravates certain contractors because you have to be more thoughtful on the construction site. Uh, it's no deal. I, I think once it, once it becomes practice, then it's fine. You know, to me, I, I don't even think twice of it. But in giving this talk enough and in seeing enough people, you know, doing work, I understand that this can be aggravating, that people just don't like that idea. They just want to be able to crank through it. And what I talk about sounds like an extra, extra thought and extra time, but it's really not true. Coordinating with subcontractors. This is the other big thing th that I talk about is if you want to have successful GI, then everybody needs to be in on it and for it from the beginning. You know, the engineer needs to be on the same page as the, as the, as the town, as the contractor, you know, as the subcontractors, and then who's ever maintaining it. Everybody needs to understand what it is what needs to happen to get it in, what it is doing, hence the bioswale upstream. Like I said, it's the, best, it's the best example I have. If everybody understood what it was supposed to do, that would have never happened. So everybody needs to understand what it is, what it's doing, what it needs to work. Again, I've seen permeable pavements that are just managed with sand so they become impervious surfaces within one winter. So everybody needs to know that things need to change. Everybody needs to be on the same page and just understand from the beginning. The, um, you know, another example, there is a boat dock that was removed during construction in Dedham, right along the, right along the river. It was a, um, uh, it was a, it was a gravel and pavered area. They took it up, they put in a new bridge, they put in new construction. They were all, every, all con conservation and everybody was all excited about how they were going to put in a new permeable paver boat dock right down there, a parking lot and boat dock right next to the river. And the uh, construction team that put it in filled the whole thing with stone dust. So it is now an open cell stone dust boat dock that is, a, is may as well just be asphalt. It is not permeable at all. And on the other end of it, you know, con conservation, you know, made a big squawk and everything. And the town basically said, well, there's nothing we can do about it now. So now there's just a big open cell paver, stone dust, boat dock installed down in Dedham. Now, if everybody was on the same page and the contractor was on the same page, then those pavers would have never been installed wrong. And we wouldn't, you know, as, 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 a, as a collective, we now have to eat that mistake. Even where you guys are, we're all just eating that mistake because of what it's doing to the water quality. The town had to eat the mistake. You know, everybody just had to suck it up and be like, oh, well. And that just kind of shows because it's actually a big deal. <clears throat> but if everybody was on the same page from the beginning and knew what needed to happen, that mistake wouldn't have happened. 
stockpiled piled materials <clears throat> need to be protected, mulch, et cetera. Those fines, washing in, like I just said, I just went off on all this. Uh, compaction issues, compaction limits, water infiltration. Water infiltration is what this is all about. We want to have water soak into our soils as much as possible. It helps in, the, in a, a bioretention facility, the water soaking in, and even just in a general landscape like a park, the water soaking in makes for drought resistant landscape, a drought resistant plants. It makes, it reduces the flooding, et cetera. So if we have wide open green space and park space, if we better manage all of that, those grassy areas and all that wide open space so that it can absorb the maximum amount of water and infiltrate that water, we will have healthier grass, we will have healthier trees and we will absorb more water and there will be a whole lot less runoff. So for instance, you know, things that I do when I am working on, on a site, I plan out where my heavy equipment's going to go and where everybody's going to be going and that's where they go. I don't have bobcats and excavators driving wherever they feel like all over the site. I plan on where that's going. So I minimize compaction. I then put down boards or track mats and say, okay, you're driving on this, you're walking on this, all the wheelbarrows are going on this, they're going over the track mats. At the end of construction, when that's all done, if it's over a grassy surface, say, I'm going to take all that up and then I aerate and compost the entire area. So I aerate that whole lawn area and then I rake in or use a compost spreader and then I spread like a quarter inch of compost on that and make sure that's all raked in. That way I am kind of opening up the soil with the aeration, allowing water and oxygen to go down back in because the track mats, there is still compaction. So I allow the, the oxygen and the water to go back down in there. And then the soil life uh, is, is boosted and is also further opened up with the addition of a thin layer of compost that makes its way down into those holes. Uh, it helps to rejuvenate some of the soil life and open up the pores that were there. I mean, I also go to different extremes and I spray down the area um, with a, a compost tea blend that I use to help boost the soil life um, to kind of cause a, a feeding frenzy. It's a, it's a compost tea and I add blackstrap molasses to it. I know you guys aren't going to do this, but it's just fun to talk about, I guess. Uh, and what happens is the sugar that, you know, the sugar from the blackstrap molasses that is mixed into the tea feeds all the bacteria and all the fungi in the soil and then everything that feeds on that starts coming and there's a giant feeding frenzy which kind of opens up the soil and then once all those sugars and all those carbohydrates and everything are used up and die down then there's all this extra carbon and all this extra space because as the bigger things come to eat the smaller things they're opening up that soil so it's something that i do um just to kind of um fast forward the process and open up the soil. But just a simple aeration is great. An aerate and a compost uh, is, is also just excellent because it just helps the soil on its way uh, better than if you just pick up the mats and leave. Trevor, to what depth does aeration work? Are there different, I mean, I've done it in my yard, but it you know, was just a few inches. Are there that's different fine. machines? That's fine. There are different machines that go a lot lower um, and those you're usually getting kind of into farming equipment, deep tine aeration. Uh, you don't need to, I don't think you need to do that. I mean, that's great, but most every landscape or construction crew usually has an aerator. It's not that hard. To, it's, they're not too, too expensive and they're not that hard to get your hands on. So I just think like just those, even those few inches, starts the process. It opens it up, lets air and water get in there because you've compacted that. Even with the mats, you've compacted that down. Um, so if you can just kind of do something as a, you know, as a, as a nod to decompaction, I think it, every little bit helps. Even if it's a little bit, you know, two inch core aeration, you know, that's, that's something. And then, like I said, if you use a compost spreader or just rake a little compost into that, you'll definitely boost that area. Uh, compaction equipment, we have 
in small in small spaces in light areas we have jumping jacks and then there are the reversible plate compactors which is really one of the most common and then we have forward plates and vibratory rollers and static rollers you get into the vibratory rollers and the static rollers more for like a, a permeable pavement application um, but more often than not just the reversible plate compactors when you're just doing a light compaction on soil um, or for also many permeable applications. You want to develop ongoing landscape and maintenance guidelines to prevent, uh, to prevent damage. So uh, this, ha and I've seen this happen and this, this is a thing. So like avoiding mulch delivery. So if you put in all sorts of pervious pavement, you know, in a, you know, municipal downtown, you know, parking lot, and then have all the mulch dumped there so you can do all the beds, you need to put down protections because you can't just dump the mulch on top of your pervious pavements. It's again, just kind of changing how we do things a little bit. Um, you do not want to ever use pesticides or herbicides in bioretention cells or on green roofs because they are di directly going to run into the water supply. The bioretention cell is gonna, it's gonna soak down through that quick draining soil. Some of it will get taken up uh, you know, in the soil, which will then also kill the soil life, which will make the, the filtration less and it will probably make its way out the underdrain. And on green roofs, it will definitely just wash right through green roofs are highly pervious. So what is erosion? Erosion is the wearing away of the land. So does anybody have any questions before I touch on definitions? Any questions? Does anybody have any situations that you see that you've, you know, that you've either, that you're either thinking about happens here or a problem that you see during construction or whatever it might be? Have I said anything to make you angry because because of how i see it and how it is in your reality <clears throat> one thing that i would say that i am seeing repeatedly i'm relatively new to the job is that the stockpiles are pretty routinely not firmed or covered in any way and i don't really know how to convince people that are not used to doing that how to do that you know i don't know how to convince them to to cover their stockpiles put it in your specs yep Okay, but if it's what if it's not my project? I'm I'm list, I'm a site inspector. I guess yeah. No, I could still do it and make it a condition of the approval. Gotcha. Yeah. Thanks. I I, I definitely think that's the best way, and I definitely you know if you're on, you know I I just I make the request. I I'm either everybody's best friend or everybody's worst enemy. You know, I. I sometimes will come off definitely as a nudge. I'll be like, you guys got to get erosion control around that. You know, people just, you know, more often than not, just especially in general construction, any type of erosion control or sock is just thrown down because it's in the spec. They just kind of, you know, it's, just, it's essentially dropped in place. It's not usually installed properly or anything. It's just kind of dropped there just to say that they have it. So, um, you know, sometimes I can come off, you know, a, as a nudge and, in the beginning, I'm not going to lie, like I hated it and I never wanted to speak up. And then I just kind of figured that if we're going to start changing the way things are done, um, somebody has to say something. So I started saying something. And in some cases, especially like when it comes to my personal suppliers, you know, what irritated them in the beginning, now I get perfect stone deliveries and perfect compost deliveries all the time because they know exactly what I want. And they know that I'm not going to put up with it otherwise. But yeah, Heather, it really comes down to, um, you know, putting it in the specs, just making it known from the beginning. Again, try to get everybody, you know, on, on that page from the beginning if you can. Um, or, you know, make it known that that's, that that's what you're looking for. Uh, erosion, just as far as definitions, the wearing of way of land uh, by running water, ice, wind, or gravity. The detached movement of soil rock fragments by water, wind, ice, or gravity. Sediment, fragmented material that originates from weathering, erosion of rocks, or unconsolidated deposits. 
and is transported or suspended in, deposited by water. Limits of disturbance, the area where the existing soil cover is changed, resulting in bare soil. So like this image to me is just, it's, it's just a nightmare. <laughs> um, but it, it has, it's just nothing but compaction and erosion. Um, and in certain cases, it's, I guess it's a necessary evil but things need to be done to, to mitigate that. Sediment, <clears throat> land that has been stripped of vegetation and, and mulched, <clears throat> uh, cleared areas, excavation, fill slopes, utility trenches, pavements. This is where you can get sediment. Stockpiles is another area, another source of sediment. Dirty equipment, source of sediment and vehicle tires and bodies, another source of sediment that can contaminate a site and undo everything that you're trying to do. Sources of pollutants, steep slopes, loose and uncompacted soils, lack of stabilized ground, surface cover with vegetation, mulch, etc. Sites with stormwater runoff, <clears throat> from off-site areas. So steep slopes, you're going to have erosion. Best thing to do is to decrease how steep that slope is, if possible. If not, then you're going to have to take precautions and do things to stabilize that slope. Methods to control pollutants when you're trying to control sediment. Allow the sediment to settle out of the water before leaving, leaving the site. <clears throat> Sed sediment traps and four bays are something that we're gonna get into quite a bit of. <clears throat> Install a sediment pond or trap to store storm water and allow sediment to fall out of the water. Use mechanical and or chemical means like flocculants to remove the sediment from the storm water prior to discharge. Preserve existing vegetation <coughs> through site design, construction sequencing, and phasing of the project, which we were talking about earlier. Um, before, can you just go back for a minute and talk about, do people flock their sediments? In certain situations, you could flock your sediments. Yep. Um, you is, that, it, is that not adding something? So it's now you're adding something to stormwater before releasing? I guess it would have to depend on what that flocculant is. Um, would be the only, the only, uh, the only thing I could say to that because it is mentioned, you know, flocking your sediment ponds to uh, before draining them. However, letting them settle out would be the thing to do, depending on what what the flocculant is. I mean, if it's highly, if it's a, if it's a, there are, I know there are. Um, relatively safe organic flocculants that you can put in, you know, and, and settle out fine debris. On a large scale pond like this, I don't know that you would do something like that. So, um, you know, that's kind of a per, per, per case kind of decision that you would have to make, not necessarily something that you need to know for the exam. Well, no, it's really coming up where we have a water main break or something and you know, it's, it's in a construction site. So you've got silt everywhere. And, you know, what do you do with the water? And so if you could get it out quicker, so you could pump it out before it settles. It's just, I didn't think you could ever add any sort of flock or you can't emit it to stormwater. Okay. That would be, I, th I think, something to check out. I think it would be maybe check out the flock and I would check out um, what may or may not be allowed. Um, there, may be a product, there may be a product or a, a method in there. Uh, it might be like a two-stage type deal, but um, there may be a method in there that could be done. I don't know. I've never had to do it. Um, Terry, I, I'll let you know that when I've seen it had to be used, um, it is for like an emergency, like let's say you have an excessive sediment discharge into your basin. 
and you use a flocculent to drop the sediments. Well, then once it's drained, you're going to go in and clean out the sediment, which contains the flocculant as well, and then dispose of it in ways that you would. Um, yeah, not in general practice, but like what you say, a water main bursts, all of a sudden you have sediment in a location and you're going to have to clean the sediment out anyways, but you're going to separate the two. That's where I've definitely seen it used before. So I, I think that's a great idea on your part because I think it works. Yeah. Oh, no. Like I said, we spent millions of dollars for sediment flowing into buildings. So uh, I will check into it as a precaution as so thank you on that. And also just check in on, um, I mean, you can use, say, you know, WEF maybe as, as, a, as a resource. Um, I know that they, you know, that there are plenty of, I mean, I get all sorts of magazines with all sorts of ads and I see many different types for, um, you know, for stormwater, mostly for much of what WEF is, is focused on is, you know, is more wastewater. So I see lots of stuff, you know, for filtration, flocculation, et cetera, you know, either advertised or articles written on it. Since it's nothing in my main purview, like I said, I don't put all the attention, in, you know, into that, but where it's something that you're dealing with, um, you know, WEF, there may be something uh, on, the, on their website or on New England, the NEWEF, um, site or article that uh, that might kind of give you some sort of an example or or even a product <clears throat> um, cover stockpiles install stabilized construction entrances and hall paths for vehicles and equipment install perimeter controls silt fencing wattles berms as a layer of protection for stormwater prevent the erosion on site in downstream by controlling flow, flow rates of stormwater. Be careful, like just be aware of what your construction is doing to, to the flow rates on the site. So silt fence, wattles and vegetation. A silt fence is a temporary sediment control device used to protect water quality in nearby water bodies <clears throat> from sediment and stormwater runoff. Silt fences and wattles are great, like I said, when they're installed properly. Wattles are logs <clears throat> or erosion sediment control devices used to minimize erosion on construction sites made of compost, core, straw, or mulch. Wattles remove sediment and allow clean water to pass through. A vegetated berm decreases the erosion, removes the pollutants from the stormwater. Now, something that you may or may not consider, I don't know if it's something that is ever even on your radar, but wattles and vegetated berms are really the only two that do not disrupt wildlife in the long term. So if you are doing, say you are installing wattles or silt fences now for a project in March or early April, you are going to absolutely disrupt uh, reptile and amphibian migration in the spring, which will usually happen mid to late April into May. So you, so wattles, turtles can climb over wattles um, as, as well as a vegetated berm, but silt fences can get right in the way and you can really disrupt the migration and um, br uh, breeding patterns of reptiles and amphibians. So it's just something to take into control because you're looking at it as a pollutant control method, <clears throat> but it, it really can also be a, uh, a liability when it comes to wildlife. I'm not sure if people were aware of that. Uh, methods for control, inlet protection, stabilize entrances and wheel washes. Inlet protection prevents sediments <clears throat> from disturbed areas by entering the city's water system through storm sewer grates and storm inlets. Stabilize entrance and entrance <clears throat> to a construction site that is stabilized to reduce the tracking of mud onto public roads by construction vehicles. Wheel wash reduces the amount of sediment transported onto paved surfaces by vehicles. So the whole idea is keeping the sediment, keeping the dirt, keeping it all on site and not 
allowing that off into the roadway where it will just wash into waterways and or storm drains. Controlling pollutants, <clears throat> mulching, covering stockpiles and dust control. Covering the bare areas with mulch or straw is an effective method pre for preventing erosion from wind and rain. <clears throat> mulch and straw reduces the impact of raindrops. Raindrops fall at 20 miles an hour, if you recall, striking the soil and cover it from, covering it from wind erosion. Covering stockpiles with a heavy tarp and check regularly to ensure that rain does not divert storm water around the piles to avoid erosion of the base of the pile. <clears throat> if stockpiles are stored for long periods of time, hydroseeding or mulch for long-term stabilization. Hydroseeding also does another thing. So the moment you dig up topsoil and stockpile it somewhere else, it instantly begins to degrade. The moment that topsoil is exposed, all of the carbon that is stored in that topsoil begins to oxidize. So you're releasing carbon into the air, just like you would be through an exhaust pipe. It's releasing that carbon into the atmosphere. So there are multiple things. Everybody thinks about the CO2 in the air and everybody blames, um, everybody blames like vehicle traffic and, and fossil fuels. And yes, vehicle traffic, fossil fuel burning and everything is a huge contributor to the amount of carbon in the air. <clears throat> However, farming and or large areas of exposed soil adds massive amounts of carbon to the air, as do say like the wildfires. Nobody thinks about that because people think that that's nature, but every time California burns for months on end, the amount of carbon that's being released into the atmosphere is exponential. So just, just things to know about. So when you are storing topsoil, as I was saying, for a long period of time, um, you begin to lose the carbon in the soil. The moment you dig up all that soil, you essentially destroy all of the life within that soil. You disrupt all the pathways, all the, um, all the hyphae, the fungi in the soil, which has all this, these pathways and these connectivities, you, all the colonies in the soil, much of the bacteria and everything, they begin to oxidize, they get exposed to sun, they get disrupted. It's kind of like an earthquake. Think of it like an earthquake. Everything comes crashing down the moment you dig up that soil. If you want to keep that topsoil healthy or as healthy as possible to put it down, so when you put it back down, it actually resembles anything like topsoil, putting a cover crop on it and having living roots within it will help sustain and rebuild some of those colonies. Now you're going to disrupt them again when you put that topsoil down. But as long as there is living material and living roots in that topsoil, you will keep the health of that topsoil. Because what happens is people think they store topsoil, but when they put it back, they're like, oh, we just put the topsoil down. No, you really just put dirt down because it's almost inert when you put it back. So by putting a cover crop, especially like an annual cover crop that you can just kind of plow in or just bury in when you return the topsoil and it'll just be done, um, is, a, is a great way to maintain soil life and maintain the health of that soil while it's stockpiled. That has nothing to do with the test. That's just a little Trevor Smith bit of information for you. Dust control on construction sites can cause air, or dust can, on construction sites can cause air pollution and impair water quality and disturb existing plant and animal habitat <clears throat> because all of that dust settling on leaves clogs the pores and chokes out the leaves. So dust control is important to have during construction. Sediment trap, surface roughing, non-structural controls. Sediment trap, <clears throat> a small temporary ponding area designed to catch and remove sediment from runoff. Surface roughening helps to control erosion by making the surface sufficiently rough with tillage, ridges, and furrows that can trap any loose soil that may be moving. Non-structural controls, are the most effective and important types of erosion and sediment control. <clears throat> These include site planning, sequencing, and contractor training.
So this is something that you're all familiar with, the Clean Water Act. I'm pretty sure I don't need to really go over much of that with this, uh, this crew um, and maintaining all the, all the regulations around maintaining water, uh, water standards. pH, this is something I see mostly in, I see it mostly in residential construction, but the discharge of, of concrete um, in cleaning the equipment, et cetera, in improper ways into the street, into the storm drain um, is, is something that is just common practice, but is detrimental to our water quality. Um, once, it, once it makes its way into the drains, especially where we were talking uh, with you guys without having the, the, sep the uh, combined systems, all of that, you know, all of that concrete slurry going through the drains and out into the waterways is, is not only going to add silt to the waterways, but it will also um, mess with the pH. Fuel and hydrocarbons, so it's important to have spill kits. I'm, you, this is, again, I'm preaching to the choir with this. This is something you guys all do readily. Um, <clears throat> I've actually had to explain spill kits and spill prevention to people before, so but it's important to understand that you have the fuel and hydrocarbons on site. It is a part of construction and you need to have, uh, be able to handle those if they get away from you. You do not use, apply pesticides or herbicides to any GI practice. Paint, you want to wash out paint and equipments uh, uh, appropriately and haul them off site, prevent them from uh, entering the stormwater systems and appropriately dispose of garbage and materials on site. Preferably recycle what is recyclable and dispose of what needs to be disposed of. <clears throat> Sources of nutrients include soils, fertilizer, compost, plant trimmings. So plant trimmings, yes, can add phosphorus and nitrogen to that. Animal waste, big thing in the city. Um, can add a whole lot of excess nitrogen to the water supply. Um, avoid sediment transport. Do not use fertilizers <clears throat> in and around waterways and also prevent, just to prevent that runoff. Um, do not use high nutrient soils and mulches in your GI practices and dispose of any animal waste. Micro, oops. Microplastics is a thing that isn't necessarily mentioned in here. You know, microplastic sources of microplastics are definitely um, our, our trash, the trash that gets away from us, tires and on, on roadways. But the, the biggest source of microplastics uh, is actually our laundry and all the microplastics that come off of our clothes. And that's the one that's slipping keep slipping through the cracks and people didn't really think about that or identify that um, right off the rip in, tr in trying to figure out where all the microplastics are coming from. They were looking at the beaches and all of the trash, the obvious of tires wearing down on roadways and everything that that adds. Um, but our, our laundry, the wastewater from our laundry systems is, is a huge contributor of microplastics. Um, sources of fuel include vehicles, equipment, fuel storage, hydro hydraulic equipment, have a spill kit on site, uh, provide containment for fuel storage to prevent spilling, and consider fueling equipment off site so you do not have an on site spill. Storing garbage, materials for garbage will be, you know, sources of our packaging materials, materials used, demolition activities, workers' lunches and beverages. Provide receptacles, appropriate receptacles for each and every uh, source of garbage so that they can be disposed of appropriately. As we talked about before, this too needs to be communicated to everybody on site, especially this just comes from working on lead projects and the like. This, you know, it is important to let everybody know that this goes here, this goes here, and this is for everything else. Otherwise, you wind up with 
I mean, all sorts of Dunkin' Donuts bags and cups in your, you know, in your either veget, you know, vegetation recycle or your mortar recycling, and it just kind of screws everything up. So if everybody knows from the beginning, this is where all this stuff goes, and everybody plays right, we can actually make these things work. Um, <clears throat> survey and layout markers are installed to provide reference. Please keep them in place for the duration of construction. Types include wooden stakes, metal discs, painted markings. <clears throat> These will also include all of the dig safe colors marking the utilities. Last section, and then we will take a break. <clears throat> safety on the uh, safety during construction and maintenance. Call dig safe before you dig. Have a traffic plan in place. Make sure that existing utilities are marked and that everybody knows where they are. <clears throat> Mark the confined spaces and ensure that everybody has the proper training when working around confined spaces. Make sure everybody has the proper PPE. Hold frequent safety meetings to inform workers <clears throat> and coordinate upcoming construction activities. Phase the project to minimize the disturbed area. Make sure you have dust control in, in place. Use trench boxes when needed and divert the stormwater away from trenches. Take precautions for electric shock hazards. 350 electric fatalities a year. Be aware of overhead power lines. <clears throat> Make sure they are de-energized when you are working around them. If they cannot be de-energized, maintain 10 feet of distance from them. If an overhead wire falls across your vehicle, stay in the car and drive away. If the engine stalls, call for help. Use non-conductive or wood fiberglass ladders <clears throat> when working near power lines. And that does this. So, what time is it? Why don't we, um, why don't we take 10? So we'll, we'll come back at quarter of 11 and we will answer any questions and or maybe start the next section and we will go from there. So thank you very much and I will see you at quarter of. Trevor, I have a question regarding the specifications. I hate to keep on these, but I think they're so important yeah. regarding um, getting the, the install correctly. Um, as far as um, you talked about at the end about um, the phasing plan, um, with the contractors, you always run into like um, means and methods. Do you have them like, do you require them to submit you a, a phasing plan as part of the submittal process? Is that how you get around that a little bit or? If, which, well, I'm sorry, can like which, which part do you, I don't always have too much say. So exactly, exactly. So do you like have them submit a phasing plan? So at least they think it out or something. Is that how you as far as how the project's going to be executed? You were talking. Yeah, you're talking about the compaction, like that kind of, of thing. You do a phasing and all that. That like, kind of thing. Well, oftentimes, like the, the compaction methods that I talked about. Yep. Um, those are that those are practices that that I do. Okay. I don't, I have not necessarily been able to have others adopt that. That is something that I hope to, you know, through conversation and education. Yeah. You know, I have a group of, um, you know, people in front of me who take on this work. It's things that I ask them to add. The, the pushback that I've had in the back is, oh, we, we do that. Now we're, we're blowing the budget. I'm like, you're not blowing the budget. Air rating after you take up the mats is not going to blow the budget. You know, but it is something to consider. Um, and it's what I would like to, you know, I would love it to be common practice. And I, I mean, if you can, I mean, it sounds like, and if, if it's written in the specs, then it's, then it's gospel. So if there's any way, I guess, 
specs and the RFP and the, you know where wherever you can kind of put that in, yeah. you know, I, I think that would be the, the, the best way to do it. However, like for instance, like if you hadn't ever thought of that before, then you wouldn't know. So by me saying it, it just puts it out there. And then maybe when you're writing something or anybody on here is writing something or thinking about it, it will start getting added. Yeah, I would say, um, Diane, the other place to think about putting it is um, as you go rewriting uh, your stormwater regulations or bylaw, that you could include a phasing plan. I mean, there's a bunch of things, you know, you could even submit in there, you know, we have oftentimes um, engineers licensed in Massachusetts or um, but you there you could write professional qualifications for people that take on certain parts of the work in putting together um, the stormwater management permit and then oversight of the project. Perfect. Yeah, because yeah. I mean, I think the thing with specifications is I always just worry, what is the contractor reading? And I think sometimes if you add a submittal, at least it gets them thinking about that kind of stuff. Um, because I mean, specifications are very long. They're extremely long and especially when they're, you know, putting a bid together, they're not going to read the whole thing before they put the bid together. It's, it's, it's just not doable. I just, it's just not, you know, they may just read it, you know, the night before they're going to do that work. And I it, it, think sometimes the placement and the specifications is just as important as actually just putting it in there. No, it's absolutely true. But have, you know, from somebody who definitely gets brain ache from reading my way through all this stuff. You know, it would be great if there was, if there was just a, a, a easier way to kind of deliver the, uh, you know, the necessary information and, you know, and everything else. Cause there's, there's just a lot of, I find information in there that isn't necessary. I, mean, I understand it's like covering your ass, uh, you know, in many different ways. So I understand like a lot of it needs to be in there, but it makes, you know, the whole pro it makes everything just so cumbersome. And like you said, a lot of people just aren't going to read it. And especially if you're trying to change a paradigm, then you, it needs to kind of be upfront, definitely, you know, what your requests are and what you would like to see, you know, is, 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 as, as soon as that can be put out there, because there may be somebody who's going to look at it and be like, forget it. And that's okay. You know, I, I think that's okay because all the, the, at least in my view, all the contractors then who are willing to step it up, who are willing to change behavior and take into consideration all these things, will start winning these bids. If like all the contractors who are just trying to get in, get out, you know, for the for the lowest amount of input, if we weed some of them out, then I think that's okay. But that's just me because I don't have to work with all the budgets and all the ramifications that you guys do. I just weed myself out. I say, here's what I can do it for. And everybody's like, yeah, that's like twice what everybody else has. And I'm like, all right, well, this is how to do it right. <laughs> this is this is what it's going to mean to do it the right way. Yeah. <clears throat> all right. So welcome back, everybody. In case you can, I don't know if you can all hear that. In case you thought you came back to the wrong webinar. That music you are listening to, and this is because we are going into bioretention. The music you are listening to is actually my philodendron. What I have done is I have connected, if you can kind of see, this is tough to see on webcam, but there are two wires coming off of my philodendron. Those are electrodes. I have hooked my philodendron up to electrodes and I am running it through a MIDI synthesizer. That MIDI synthesizer is connected to my iPad, which is exactly what you are listening to. Why the hell would I do all of this? I am doing this because I am try what you are listening to are the biorhythms or the electrical energy of that philodendron. So the, what it's doing is it's taking the electrical energy that is running through the plant which is essentially the way the plant is reacting to the environment and turning those, those electrical impulses into music. So again, why would, why would I make you listen to that? Well, I would make you listen to that because we look at trees, we look at plants, we look at nature as, as it's a static thing. And it's certainly not a tree while it doesn't move these, 
these are not static things. These are not <clears throat> things at all. They are actually living beings and there is a whole, there's a whole lot going on within them. You know, so it's when we are talking about root zones and protecting root zones. And when, we, when I talk to you about all this stuff, it's important. And it's important because we don't look at soil like it's a living thing. And we don't even really look at our plant material like it's a living thing. But all that music you heard was my philodendron reacting to how it feels today in my office and how it feels today with me, with the vibration of my voice, et cetera. All of that translated into music is exactly what you, what you were hearing. So when you were looking at plants, considering plants and soil and the like, you have to, you know, you just have to know and understand that there's a whole lot going on that we don't see. Trees especially are very slow, deep time beings. You know, trees, they, they breathe, they have essentially what can be considered a heartbeat. They actually, when they sleep at night, their branches drop. We just don't notice these things because they're very slow and they're very subtle. They actually have contractions you know, within them that can resemble, say, a heartbeat, but it happens over the course of hours. So it's just so slow that we don't necessarily notice it. Those of you who really geek out on plant stuff understand about the wood wide web and have probably heard that like trees can communicate with each other and they can communicate with the soil and they communicate with the environment around them. You know, for instance, when a storm is coming, a tree senses that the storm is coming and it starts to send extra sugars down into its root system just in case it gets damaged during that storm so that it has enough energy to begin the repair process on the other end. So, you know, the, the environment around us, the natural world is extremely capable. It's extremely full of life and consciousness. It's just not one that we definitely, that we understand and know. We can't really compare it directly to what we know as consciousness and that what we know as life. We move a whole lot faster. Nature is slow. Nature moves very slow, and the faster our world moves, the less we understand how actually involved and complex nature is because it moves at such a slow pace and it's very quiet about it. There's no virtual signaling, you know, a tree's not like, I offset a whole ton of carbon today. Like, you know, it doesn't put that on Facebook like everybody else would. You know, there's none of that going on. It just does it, it does its job, and it's quiet about it. So, I mean, it's, it's a really big, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a really big deal. And it's just, that's the best way that um, I, can, I can show that example. Also, once I started studying things like that, I never really looked at nature the same. You know, I, once, once I've actually heard a number of plants and trees and the kind of music and the things that they make, now it's like I can be outside and I can be walking and I'm just aware that there's a whole biorhythm and electrical energy coursing through that plant that's not necessarily music at the time that I'm walking through it, but there's a lot going on and I'm just aware now so much more of all the complexities, all the stuff in nature that I just don't see and necessarily understand. So I just wanted to share all that with you. <clears throat> a brief little interlude, maybe mellow you out just a little bit if you were feeling a little anxious this morning. Um, what we will do is we will go through um, the bioretention and for the next for the next bit, um, we will stop for lunch at whatever the next logical uh, breaking point, breaking off point comes here, um, and then we will continue uh, after lunch. Finish this out, but this will probably be the last one for the day. I'm hoping that from here on out, there's maybe some more interaction and some more questions because we're flying through all this content <coughs> um, extremely fast. Um, this is definitely the quickest class I've ever taught. So um, I'd like to have a little kind of back and forth uh, if possible. But I will jump into bioretention, which is probably out of all of these, probably my favorite to teach. So we'll have fun here. <clears throat> I like bioretention because I feel it um, has the, the most 
<clears throat> out of all the methods that we're discussing, I feel it has the most overall impact. It impacts the the habitat and the environment ar you know around us. It filters our stormwater, but it's good for our citizens, the humans around it. Um, it's and it's really good for the environment. So it's like to me, this is like the the as as close to the perfect system um, as you can get. You know, it will filter heavy metals. It will filter plastics. It will filter hydrocarbons. Um, and one of the things that I am doing is trying to come up with uh, recipes that I can hopefully submit to, you know, Mass DOT and maybe get approved by the state of Massachusetts. But I'm trying to come up with, with different recipes that I can put out there um, for different situations. There are things that I've created personally, but I need all of these things heavily tested before anybody will actually believe that they work which is the other piece with much, you know, with green infrastructure is it doesn't have, I mean, there, there's plenty, there's plenty of testing, there's plenty of studies, there's plenty of examples. Uh, I find that people always want one more test, one more study, one more example, and then they want to have a meeting discussing that study and then a meeting discussing that meeting. And that's not getting GI in the ground. And at this current rate, you know, there are, there are plenty of, of deadlines kind of looming over us. Like we have about 50 to 60 years of topsoil left um, before, it is, before it is all gone and farming becomes, you know, near impossible. Now we can say, well, we won't be here in 50 years or 60 years or what difference does it make? Some of us will, um, and it does make a difference. <clears throat> so these are things that are important to me. But let's just get on with this and I'll get off my soapbox. So we are going to talk about bioretention cells and swales, rain gardens, vegetated curb extensions, um, bioretention planters, and tree trenches. If you wait about 15 minutes, you might be able to catch an extra shower. We are going to identify the potential safety hazards and the PPE required for dealing with um, bioswales. If you guys could all just throw yourselves on mute, if you unless you have a question, um, we need to read and comprehend basic engineering plans for this. Recognize how to manage uh, utilities and other things around bioretention. Understand the significance and identify the procedures for stormwater management during construction. Recognize the significance of proper storage and handling of materials and understand how to inspect and maintain. So from here on out, every single thing is basically going to be the same. It's going to be, how is this constructed? How is it inspected and maintained? And how do I ident identify when it is failing? And for me, it's all of these, you know, from here on out are essentially going to cover all of that. Recognize the appropriate equipment for construction, identify the various activities and maintenance, identify signs that it is not working, <clears throat> performance issues, describe the activities and inspection maintenance schedule based on the months and seasons, understand the need for testing to verify performance. So what is bioretention? On a small scale, bioretention is a vegetative depression that receives stormwater from a small contributing area, like a section of road or a rooftop, and is used to slow, store, and treat that stormwater runoff. Stormwater runoff <clears throat> infiltrates and perks through the soil, the plant roots, where it is treated by a number of physical, chemical, and biological processes. It is, <clears throat> the slowed water is cleaned and allowed to infiltrate through the native soils or directed to nearby storm drains or receiving waters. They may be single cell, multi-cell connected for flow control, water quality treatment and conveyance. So this is trusting in nature that the filtration process can happen. This is, these are great because a bioretention facility, whether it be a swale or a cell, is very easy to connect to existing um, stormwater infrastructure. Is relative through through under drains and overflows, it is very easy to connect 
to uh, to the existing infrastructure, which is great because then we are marrying the green and the gray. So we don't have to throw out everything we have. We can continue with the practices we know. This is just adding another layer of filtration, another layer of protection. How great would it be if we had less pollutants in the water that does run into our receding waters? How great would it be if in like a standard rain event, we didn't really have any water flowing through our storm system? Or we had a massive reduction to the water that is flowing through our pipes? That would be great for our pipes and for our receiving waters, et cetera. If we could take that out, there would be less flooding. The water that did make it through the system is going to be cleaner than what it is now. So again, I can't advocate enough for, for these. So as you just saw with the diagram, how does it work? Well, water enters the bioretention area, moves vertically through the planted and engineered soil media. It infiltrates into the subgrade or flows out through an underdrain. <clears throat> Overflows through a controlled outlet into larger into larger storm drains. So we have it has the it has the three options. It does not always depending on the area all that water can be filtered through and straight out through an underdrain or it can have the option like when the when the system is inundated and there's too much water to infiltrate into the subgrade, the underdrain can also be there, uh, or it can just be designed, depending on, on the infiltration rate, it can just be designed to infiltrate all that water uh, into, into the subgrade. It can provide <clears throat> flow control and volume control. The plants, and media physically filter and chemically bind stormwater contaminants. And then that water is taken up and sent back into the atmosphere through evapotranspiration, which will restore our short water cycle, which I talked about last time. Uh, so the evapotranspiration is great because it also cools our urban areas, cools the areas around us. Uh, we can restore our groundwater, which is key. Restoring the groundwater is key to make sure that we have water for us to drink, but it is also key to make sure that all of our plants uh, in our surrounding areas and all of the wildlife in our surrounding areas, that, that there is water there. We, want to, we need to make sure that we have adequate groundwater available. <clears throat> but again, the, the, the most direct correlation is the fact that it's going to reduce the, um, the velocity of the flows and it's going to reduce the volume of water that is making it into, into our system. So bioretention cells are great for single family lots, commercial areas or parking lots. Rain gardens, single family lots, small commercial areas. So if you recall, when we talked about biocells and rain gardens, a rain garden generally deals with just the native soils. It doesn't have an underdrain uh, and its overflow is usually just a depressed area on one side of it that allows the water to spill out of it. It does it is not would be and is in no way, you know, usually connected to a greater system like municipal storm drains <clears throat> and it isn't necessarily uh, doesn't necessarily have any kind of engineered soils involved with it. That is for bioretention cells and bioswales. So a bioswale is typically for a right of way. And then we get into the planters and planter boxes for high urban areas, rights of way adjacent to buildings and vegetated curb extensions. <clears throat> So a bioretention cell is a shallow vegetated depression with gently sloping sides. It can be designed as an individual, you know, receiving from multiple areas <clears throat> and it can be de designed as an individual area just to receive or it can be part of a conveyance system, which would be a bioswale. 
it contains a engineered soil media. And that soil media is designed to perk at a specific rate and can be designed to mitigate um, specific toxins and pollutants that may be going into it. It does have the option of under, under drains and overflow control structures. And so the size of it is, varies for the contributing area. It is designed and more often, as I've seen, undersized to capture water from a specific area, whether it be a parking lot or a building or both or uh, a right of way <clears throat> in certain cases. For single family residences, we're talking about 200 square feet. In urban areas, bioretention cells <clears throat> are often the same scale as residential areas, but maybe larger and linear, located along streets 10 feet wide and 40 feet long. This is the standard detail of a bioretention cell. So you can see we have the, the whole width, the top width of what the cell is. The gently sloping sides, then we have that bottom width. That is the deepest portion of the cell. And there is a designed ponding depth. So it is, the whole cell is designed to hold a specific amount of water and begin to infiltrate that water. In this specific cell, we have the overflow structure. So if too much water makes it into that cell at one point in time, then it will just begin to overflow and can, that can get connected right to uh, a, a storm drain. We then have the under drain. So as that water makes its way through the cell, by the time it reaches the bottom, it is then well filtered and then makes its way to the under drain, which too can be connected uh, to your system. The bioretention mix is designed to do all of that filtering. And that's where if you have <clears throat> diverse plant material and a healthy bioretention mix with healthy biota in it, you can break down hydrocarbons, you can trap <clears throat> microplastics, and you can handle pretty much any toxin, heavy metals, anything that's going to flow in there, that that soil will either bind up within the soil uh, or will break down. <clears throat> so the rain garden, like I said, is same as a bioretention cell. The soil may or may not be amended, usually no under drains or overflow of structures. Specific subgrade soil properties are less restrictive than bioretention typically receives less water. So this is more, rain gardens are more for, again, like a, you could build a rain garden, you know, on a building like a library, but it's usually for a residential lot. <clears throat> Typical rain garden is about 200 square feet. A 100 square foot rain garden will often receive water from an area five to 10 times larger than the rain garden. A typical rain garden is about six, six inches, six to eight inches deep. And as you can see here, there is an overflow, but that overflow is just part of the rain garden design out the back. It's not an actual pipe that leads to anywhere. Uh, it is just a, a low area in the edge of the rain garden where the water can pass through. A rain garden can be made into any shape and size you want, as long as the overall size of the rain garden is enough to handle the amount of water that is going to be flowing into it. Um, it yeah. Just a quick question. Um, with good maintenance, is there like a design life for these? Like, do you have to replace the soils like with the contaminants and things like that? Or what's the design life of these? Not with, with proper maintenance, you're, you're fine. Um, and the design life, as far as I know, is, is relatively with mid maintenance relatively infinite and in, in what i'm saying is you know if plant, certain plant material gets too large like say over 10 years 15 years then you may have to remove that um there is you know if a, if an instant happens and the whole system becomes clogged with sediment 
then you may have to, you know, re reconfigure. Um, but if it is just doing its thing uh, and you have a healthy system that is properly maintained, it, there's no reason why it shouldn't just keep going. Okay. Even on roadways, like with um, salting of roadways or sanding of roadways, like, do you find that issue like right next to public right of ways at so, all with the soils? Uh, again, so, and we, we'll get into that when we get into kind of like four bays and buffer strips. Um, you know, salt can definitely be an issue, but you can amend the soil and or treat, the, you can amend the soil in the beginning with like, with gypsum, say, and that will make that soil salt resistant. And then there are soil drenches designed to move, help leach, like push salt through the soil. So there are definite, you know, it, it might take maintenance, but there are definite ways to, you know, to handle all that. Through four bays and buffer strips, you can keep out, you know, a, a bunch of the sand that, that could typically make its way in there. Um, Sand overall shouldn't be detrimental unless you're having massive amounts. Uh, and you'll know, you know, when the system starts to slow down or fail that, you know, maybe, uh, maybe it's the, the, um, the soil, the media is getting clogged. But overall, and this is, you know, this is in, in a perfect world when designed and maintained right, uh, you should be fine because what's going to happen is the roots are just going to go deeper and open up that soil and give that water plenty of places to go. Uh, and without any massive amount of silt clogging the overall soil media, the water should just be able to keep entering and moving through the system. The more soil life you have and the more root activity you have, the more hydrocarbons um, and, and toxins you'll be able to bind and break down within the soil. So there really isn't, I mean, nature's pr a, a pretty great filter. So it's really would be hard to um, overwhelm it you know, in theory, in a perfect world. Does it and can it happen? Absolutely. Especially with sand, like maybe not right away, but say like with parking lots. When yeah, like, that's what I'm thinking. <laughs> when, when all of it just washes in there, but with um, a proper four bay and a proper maintenance plan of said parking lot, you know, if that parking lot is not just let to have all the spring rains wash all that sand from the winter into it, then, you know, if you have that parking lot cleaned and if you have a proper four bay that's easy to clean, you can prevent these things from happening. Again, it needs, to, as was said in like the first module, you know, it just needs to be, you need to think it through in the design. Yep. That's the part that I love. Yep. I love, I love, I love thinking of ways to make it better. Um, and then in, in, in doing that and in, in seeing how other things failed and in building these things and having them fail, you know, having them not perform how I wanted them to and or fail myself, then I've kind of been able to kind of tweak and understand, you know, along the way, how important it is to say, have a four bay or some sort of a sediment chamber that's easy to clean. Because if it all runs through riprap and that riprap, and we'll see an example of it, uh, it's actually, there's one in here, but like if all that riprap gets full, then that's like a full day of just moving boulders to rake out sand to put all those boulders back. And that's just sucks. That's not realistic. So you have to kind of be aware of what's going on. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? All right. Uh, cross section of a rain garden again six inches is your your average um, your average depth uh, there are multiple calculators Yukon has a an app I think I know it's on Apple I don't know if it's on Android but you can just put in the square footage and it will basically tell you the size of the rain garden you need it's a wonderful app to have because right, you can then use their little slide scale to say uh, in this in if in a two inch rain event in a one inch rain event how big does it need to be you know it'll tell you it needs to be 1500 square feet and you're like well if i don't have 1500 square feet what if i make it eight inches and it'll say only 700 square feet like beautiful i'm going to make it eight inches deep instead of six inches deep real way to just kind of quick and dirty calculate um you know many of many of these things while we do need to be pretty accurate um on you know, as far as 
stormwater management and everything goes. Um, we do need to figure out it's the, the biggest calculation, the biggest thing that needs that we need to know is how much water are we gathering um, and how fast do we need to either infiltrate it or facilitate it through the facility uh, to make sure that it doesn't get overwhelmed. Calcul you know, figuring that um, is relatively easy. Much of this is intuitive, I've found. And then having a fail safe, like having an overflow is something, you know, definitely needed because our rain events are becoming rather unpredictable. And if it rains for like, you know, if we get three, four inches in two days, it's gonna be a lot. However, a normal rain event where we get like an inch, you know, though that, that could get eaten up with a properly designed bioswale, that could get eaten up and none of that water might make its way, um, you know, in, into an under drain or into a pipe. <clears throat> So just here we have the, the, the overall, just to understand, we have the overall dimensions, then there's the overflow area, and then we have the, the, the uh, harvesting, we'll call it, I guess, or uh, dimensions of the rain garden um, with the designated ponding depth. Bioretention swales. Now this is, everybody calls like, people use bioretention cell and bioswale bio interchangeably and it's not necessarily the case. A bioswale is very different. So a biocell is going to capture that rainwater and that filters the rainwater vertically. The water moves through the soil, straight down through the soil. A bioswale filters the water horizontally. A bioswale is designed to convey the water and move it through its through the system, capture it where it is, and then move it, slowly move it as that water builds up or gets to be too much. It just kind of keeps moving it through the through the whole system, infiltrating it along the way. So a bioswale are connected bioretention cells. They convey storm water and excess, uh, excess water flow from the street, as you can see. <clears throat> um, note, oh, there it is. Note that bioretention cells provide treatment infiltrating vertically and bioswales provide treatment horizontally. So bioswales bio are typically located along roadways, <clears throat> long linear facilities. So you can see here, Diane, just kind of touching on that question, that whole grass strip right there is a vegetated buffer. So that's going to capture like a lot of the sand that you would be uh, concerned with. So if you can design it with some sort of a vegetated buffer, that's excellent. <clears throat> also in this picture, just one of my pet peeves, and because I'm looking at it, I'm just going to point it out. You will see this beehive right here. That's the overflow for this cell. Oftentimes, when I go to look at a facility or if I go to fix a facility, the beehive is set down at grade. It's put down here. So the, all the water is just going into the system and flowing right out of the system. This is supposed to be set at the, at the top of the, pond, the designed ponding depth. So that's just another misunderstanding that happens so often is a bioswale will be installed and the beehive is just kind of set right down there at the bottom at, at grade, in which case it's not capturing, holding, or infiltrating any water at all. It's all just pouring right out. So that needs to be set at the design ponding depth or just above so it can be used as an overflow. <clears throat> Typical bioswale size can be 100 feet or more. The top is usually 10 to 12 feet and the bottom width is usually one to two feet. And is, again, is designed for the water to flow through it. This is, to me, I mean, this is definitely the easiest. Turf, as we discussed, is a semi-pervious surface. So it is not, not necessarily ideal for capturing and infiltrating water. This is ideal for maintenance because you can just go down in there, you can mow it. It's, real, it's a real piece of cake. 
However, this is going to convey more water than if, say, the basin of this um, was a planted garden. which requires different maintenance, but will absorb more water. <clears throat> so bioswale standard details, <clears throat> as you can see, and many of you have probably seen these. We have the bottom of the swale, and again, the top of the swale. This type of thing will, being able to read these, I am told, will be on the exam, so I think all of you will do well. It will just ask you a question regarding a plan and or a, a detail like this, and you'll just need to understand um, <clears throat> really from the drawing what it is and how it works. The vegetated curb extension. This is something I would like to see more of, um, and that is because many of the um, meetings that I sit in on, so I'll sit in on, I'll be proposing or there will be a proposed um, green infrastructure or whichever in the neighborhood, but they'll get the, anytime I sit in on a neighborhood meeting, and it usually involves Boston, Cambridge, Somerville, et cetera, um, the biggest thing is traffic control. So this to me is a, a great way to offer the traffic control while building in stormwater. You know, right here in Arlington, we just built a bunch of bulb outs that are just, just big asphalt, you know, extensions out into the street, you know, and that's fine and that's real easy and they're there and it is a thing. However, I, f I see it as missed opportunity because if these were vegetated curb extensions, then we would have the traffic control, but we would also be reducing stormwater and, and we'd add flow control to our traffic control. These are definitely tough areas to design, plant, um, not necessarily maintain because they're, they're relatively easy to get in and out of. Um, one thing, I think I may have said this to you, but I'll say it again. One thing that people say to me all the time is that, you know, bio cells and say something like this just collects trash. That's what it's supposed to do. It's keeping the trash from going down the grate and out into the waterways or going down the, down the grate and to the, um, to the water treatment plant. You know, so the idea is that they collect trash. So cleaning, cleaning these and keeping the trash out of them is part of the maintenance uh, for this. <clears throat> these are definitely, um, these definitely receive a huge amount of toxins. But again, if you're going, if you're planning on traffic control, and you're planning on ball boats, et cetera, why not add flow control to it? Why not add green space, green corridors, et cetera, to all that? You know, I just feel like if in our designs and in every, the way we think, we should try to get as much as possible from every, you know, from every installation we have. So this could be all asphalt or all concrete, and that would slow down traffic, but that would not, you know, give you the added the added benefit. So big fan of these. <clears throat> Trevor, before you move on, I'm just noticing some of the detail in this, especially, um, you know, a lot of times we see sort of notched curbing and I've also seen plows hitting it. And so the curbing get deteriorates, but this looks like it's a raised curb um, toward us. And then there's some kind of sediment forebay or splash pad beyond yep. the curb. The detail on this looks really interesting. Yeah, I, this is, I mean, the notched, the notched curb, I hear, I hear all the time about, you know, about the plows. Um, I see all the time, whether it's asphalt or not, the ball bouts. I mean, it's like, I guess, I mean, it's what, it's what happens, I guess, when you're plowing all night long, you just crash into shit. Uh, sorry, crash into things. Um, but, um, here, yes, here with the, with the raised curb, with the inlet and the splash pad, we're dealing with, you can see we have the flow control, but uh, like the, the Cheetos wrapper is going to come down in here and flow right into here and get caught up in the carex. but the sediment and the leaves and stuff are all going to hit the, the splash pad and or if you had a four bay in here, 
all of that would come in, it would settle out, overflow into the system. So then this system wouldn't necessarily get clogged with all that sand and sediment. It would be in here. And if you had a cement forebay that you could go at with a flat shovel and just scoop out simple maintenance. These are things that I've kind of been inst instructing on when I look at these plans, because you need to be able to think of how quick can somebody come in there? How easy is that four bay to clean? Now the splash pad is there to slow the velocity and disperse the water through the system. And that splash pad is, is great and is working perfectly. What's gonna happen is that right here on the other end of it is eventually gonna get heavily silted, heavily sanded. So if you can have some place for that sand and silt to settle out, then that first six inches to a foot won't get all filled with your debris and you won't have to worry about cleaning that out as well. But yes, so it doesn't get dinged by a plow or it's plow resistant and designing it for maximum, uh, maximum infiltration and filtration. You know, again, that's why, that's where I would change this. I would have this splash pad actually be a four bay wide enough that you could go in there with a flat shovel or a flatty as I call them, just scoop that out as part of regular maintenance. Then you just have to go in, you scoop that out, you pull out the trash, boom, you're done. After that, as that overflows, all that water is going to make its way through the system here. And you can either have it exit out onto the street again, say this gets inundated, it could exit out on the street again down here uh, and just go right down the storm drain the storm drain proper, uh, but the majority of the water would get absorbed all through here. And again, it's just, it beautifies our curbs, et cetera. So here's just, you know, here's this, just that design. You have the inflow, that water's coming in. It makes its way through all, all types of plant media, you know, which is great. You have all different root depths, all, all types of things happening here and then you have the overflow. And if the overflow goes right to a drain, think of how much cleaner that water is gonna be once it makes it there. And think of how much less water there's actually going to be going down that drain if it's getting intercepted um, by this bulb out. However, again, the big thing here is thinking about the water that's coming in. That water that's coming in is gonna have a ton of candy wrappers and trash coming through it and it's going to have all that road sand and silt that is accumulated over the course of just a day or a week etc so that first flush is going to carry a lot into there so here's the cross section now these aren't, don't necessarily need to connect to native soils. This one has a gravel storage area so that water can make its way through the, uh, the soil media and actually down into the gravel. And in that gravel storage area, it can get dispersed and continue to infiltrate into native soils. If that's not a case, if the area is too built, if you have utilities, et cetera, et cetera, then an under drain here connected to the, uh, the storm drain system would be an excellent thing to have because that, then and again, that water's coming through here, it's going to be filtered. It's going to leave here cleaner than it entered, which means it's gonna go into the storm drain cleaner than when it entered. But these, bulb, these, these extensions aren't necessarily designed to infiltrate. They're designed to kind of move that water. They're going to infiltrate, but they're also gonna move the water through. Either way, the water will be cleaner than when it entered. Like I said, very simple, you know, very simple to me, very simple and great idea. Oftentimes, if we, well, here's an example of curb cuts. This is a sidewalk, so it's a whole lot easier. But we have um, bioretention planters or bio boxes, stormwater boxes, <clears throat> vertical walled reservoirs, typically concrete, designed soil media. In heavily urban settings, this is a great way to plant street trees. A whole lot of soil volume here. May have an open bottom, two native soils, or lined to an underdrain. More often than not, this is going to be something you line for an underdrain. 
in a simple version when we were talking about way back in day one, when we were talking about it feels like way back, um, ways to use rubber liner. If you have shops all over here, you would put the rubber liner against the soils in the trench here to keep the water from saturating the soils and working this way via capillary action and to the foundations. But here in this example, this, this specific example, this is a box that's dropped. So these are all concrete sides. Um, I don't know whether it has an open bottom or not, but again, the idea is the water is going to come in, come in through here, come in through here and just get caught work its way down through that soil and then out via the under drain say and it's going to be a whole lot cleaner if this got way overwhelmed then it would exit down here but it's also taking the water off the sidewalk so it's just capturing water off the sidewalk that's coming off the roofs and whatever over there and water from the street and just taking that again what it's doing you can see there's another one down here this little tree trench is not responsible for the entire street we're taking little tiny bites all the way down the street by installing multiple tree trenches. You're pulling in 500 gallons or a thousand gallons at a time and infiltrating that rather than trying to take, you know, 12,000 gallons and infiltrate it into one, into one pipe. Here again, in most rain events, like if we were to have just an inch, the water would come in, the water would flow into this and you'd never see it again, which is excellent. <laughs> I have a, a quick question. Yeah. Um, how, what prevents this from being a tree coffin? <laughs> the, the, the actual, the amount of soil volume. This is, <laughs> this is an excellent um, amount of soil volume to, to support a tree. And if it is open to the native soils down below, uh, design, you know, if it's designed to infiltrate, but is open on the bottom, then that tree can definitely go forever. But that amount of soil volume is way more than we ever give any of our trees. So the three by three and four by four boxes, they, they, ha they probably aren't connected to the soil at the bottom? The, the, are you talking about like the, the tree box filters or are you talking about a standard tree pit? Um, I'm not sure. It's the, I think it's standard tree pit. The thing you were talking about, we put these street trees out there and we only give them a tiny room and then they it, die. Exactly, like the four by six or the, or yes. So like those, the, those tiny little areas um, don't, you are usually compacted don't allow for much water to get in there and underneath all of that there isn't really any room for the roots to expand out you know to to go anywhere and we're going to get into things you can do um to to make sure that you have soil volume um available for your trees cool thanks So your typical bioretention planter size is three to six feet, <clears throat> length three to six feet wide, and uh, 20, you know, 20 to 30 feet long, which, you know, depending on how deep it is, that's, you know, that's about, you know, 18 inches deep. That can hold a lot of water. Last class, people were saying that there is no way, this is Portland, people were saying there's no way that you could have this without a fence around it because somebody's going to fall in. That could be a thing. So may, you might have to think about putting a fence around it because anybody not looking at their phone may trip over the curb and just fall in. Um, but I mean, there is a raised curb around it. I, I don't know. I don't know what to say. I can't. The the having to having to like human proof and stupid proof the world as well as save it via you know for cl from climate change is is a huge uh, a huge task. But, you know, things like this in heavenly urban areas are great because you're going to increase the viability of any of the street trees you are planting. And again, you are taking stormwater out of the system little chunks at a time. You know, if you had seven, five, 12 of these 20 foot by six foot systems going down, you know, down a street, you were going to pull out massive amounts of water and massive amounts of pollutants. And here is again just a bioretention bio um, drawing, but you have the you have the inlet, you have that curb cut. Essentially, is what it's probably going to be, or you, you know there'll be some sort of a, a, a curb cut here, 
that will catch the water. The water is going to flow down the street and it's going to go right into here. All this under here, could, these could be permeable pavers and all this under here could be, you know, could be soil or retention media. Here you have the splash pad, so the water's coming through. It's gonna hit the splash pad, which will prevent it from eroding the soil that's in there <clears throat> and just pouring right in and crashing right in. Again, I always like to, with a splash pad, create some sort of a way for sediment to settle out so that ultimately, let's just say, there is construction down the street or there, you know, there's construction on the street, say they're working, you know, uh, working on a gas line or something like that and it rains and all sorts of soil washes in here. If it just hits the splash pad, then you're going to get a big wash of soil uh, all through here and that's going to clog your system. This one also has check dams so that the water can come rushing in. This is gonna fill, it'll slowly fill out into here and filter out into here. So multiple types of flow control, multiple ways to just control the water and ease the water through the system so that it doesn't get inundated all at once. And when it does get inundated, you've slowed that water down, you've stolen the velocity. So now it's very gently moving through the system where it can be taken up by the soil, where it can be addressed by the roots, where it can remain <clears throat> in that soil. So most, much of the water in a one inch rain event isn't gonna make it out down here. It's gonna just stay in this soil right here, watering all those plants and filtering its way down through the soil. Um, <clears throat> retention cross-section just so you can see you have the raised curb so that hopefully people don't go falling in uh, you have you have here this one actually has an overflow so if this were just a contained unit um, and this also has an open bottom with the gravel storage so the idea with this cutaway is that all the water is going to come here it's going to work its way through the soil most excess water will wind up down here in the gravel storage area, but then make its way into the native soils uh, and just continue to continue through. If we had a giant rain event or if these soils were all saturated to the point where they couldn't take on anymore, then you have this little overflow to handle that and just have that run out it's good because the, our storms are unpredictable and because we don't know what they are. And it's good because our space is, you know, space and budgets are such that maybe we cannot build enough tree trenches to handle all the water. So they may get overwhelmed. So have that backup system, have that fail safe system. But let's just say these things handle six or seven storms out of 10, you know, and three of them you need the overflow on. That's awesome. That's, you know, that's, that's huge progress. I mean, shoot, if they, if they handled four storms, you know, four out of 10 completely. And then if, you know, a few others just kind of peed out the overflow, you know, that would be, that would be great too. You know, that's, that's huge progress. And I mean, if you think about, think about the cost savings on, on that end, think about the, you know, including the environment especially like you, you guys were saying, you don't have combined. So think about, you know, the effluent on the, the reduction in, in, wa in, the, in the water that's making it out to your waterways and think about the quality of the water that is. You know, if there were an under drain here, think about how filtered that water is and think about how much longer it's going to take for it to get there. Just like recreating the natural water cycle. If it takes a full day for this box to drain rather that's and then that water makes it to the under drain and makes its way through the under drain out to out to the river well that's a whole lot better than it running down the street and making it to the river in an hour or five minutes so we've reduced the the volume that's going to cut down on the flooding that's going to cut down on the flooding that's going to cut down on the pollution because the water that's now making its way there has been scrubbed and it's been scrubbed by nature, making its way into a natural system. So that natural system is going to identify it. Trevor, I have a, oh, of course, I have a question. Um, 
So one thing that we hear from our communities um, sometimes, or, or you know, different staff people, um, might be that there's a concern that the more um, green infrastructure that exists that's filtering uh, pollutants from stormwater runoff, um, it will make the uh, pollution, and Patty, please correct me if I'm getting this wrong, because I know that you have these conversations too, but it will make the um, stormwater that's actually coming from uh, the outfalls themselves um, more concentrated, like the pollution more concentrated in uh, the outfalls from the stormwater that's not, that's not going through those green infrastructure systems. And that's something that um, I have not, I just haven't seen anything written about that. And I was wondering if you have like experience in that, is that a concern that you hear from municipalities? Um, and how do you address it if, you, if it is? I, I haven't and I don't, I don't understand. So how would water filtered by say a tree planter be more concentrated in pollutants? that the water that's going through the green infrastructure would be more concentrated but that the water that's left out of the green infrastructure so it's like in on streets or something like that that don't have any green infrastructure installed then the water that's um would eventually combine there's less water coming in from the green infrastructure so that the water that's left going through the outfalls is more concentrated in pollutants because it doesn't have this other it, all the other water has been removed. Does that make more sense? Yeah, it's an end of pipe question. And it yeah, was, it's one, it's not, I, I would qualify that it was one public works director in one community that was sort of saying that, well, if I put in these practices, then my end of pipe concentrations are going to be higher because there's less water diluting mm -hmm. um, the pollutants. Okay, I've never heard that. Um, and I would, I would love to counter with, how about this? How about we install a bunch of green infrastructure and then do a study on the water at the outfalls? And then maybe we can have a meeting about that study and a meeting about the meeting. How about we just reverse the process and actually see? Because I can see in theory, I guess, where you'd be going with that, but I, 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 I haven't, I've never heard that before, so I don't even know how to respond because I can't say, no, there's no way that can't happen because I guess if you are combining, you know, A, B, and C Street all into one drain and that's running out, then you have all the water from A, B, and C Street um, combined, which to me would be higher in a nutrient load. And then if you took out B and C Street and made those green streets and you only had A Street, then yes. I guess all the water coming off of A Street, you just have that that nutrient load. But if then if that nutrient load is, I would say, let's just say B and C Street is also coming through the storm drain via an under drain after that water is scrubbed. Now you have like clean water, cleaner water mixing with the higher nutrient load. So I guess what would happen is during a storm event that initial outfall effluent would be higher in, in, a, in a nutrient load, I guess, possibly. But anything coming behind it that has gone through green infrastructure is going to be relatively clean. You know, if all that water has gone through, it, that will be free of microplastics, many heavy metals, and hydrocarbons. So that will be cleaner water that's, that's ending. So you might get a dose you might get a tablespoon of dirty water, but then you'd get two tablespoons of clean water. So I, I would think it would reduce that and balance it out. I've never heard that argument. So I'd really have to think that, let me work on that. I'm gonna, <laughs> but I've, I've, I've never heard that argument. And it doesn't, it doesn't sound valid to me. And I'd, I'd actually wanna see proof. Yeah. With the amount of times that people tell me to prove that these things work, I'd love somebody to like wait and do it right and then prove to me that they don't work. Because there's plenty of studies that do say, mostly from the West Coast is the problem, but there's plenty of studies that say these things do work. 
um, the Puget Sound is so much cleaner and everything else. So, um, but no, I've never heard that, but that's a great, it's a great question. I just have to think on that a little bit more. Yeah, whenever I think it through, it doesn't come out the way that he's arguing, but it's hard to figure out really sound. And I like your idea of taking A, B, and C Street and then actually figuring out if the pollutant loading from each and what is your overflow. Like you could get more dilution with clean water. Um, so, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know that it holds water. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So before we get into inlets, since it's 1147, why don't we take our half hour? And then we will come back and we will finish bioretention. So we will, let's just say 1150, we'll come back at 1120. All right. And then we can handle any questions from there. I'm going to think about that over the next half hour, but, um, but I will see you all in a little bit. You should all also um, let us know how you got your philodendron to sing. Like how you get that equipment. That would be so cool to hook it up to different plants and hear the different sounds that are emitted. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, tell you that when I get back. Okay, great. All right. <laughs> Uh, I'm more than happy to come out and just kind of discuss how to get the most out of the money that you got and, you know, the things to kind of whittle away on. So I'm more than happy to kind of look at those plans and help you maximize uh, what's going on, um, as well as lead you in the way of contractors that are qualified to do the work. So, okay, Thanks, Trevor. You got it. All right, Dave, we'll touch base on Thursday morning. Sounds good. All right. I'll, I'll tell Bill that we're going to go Thursday afternoon. All right. I think we're ready for our meeting, aren't we? Yeah, we're getting about to get going. Okay, go I would like to, I did not, in starting this, I did, I did not kind of say happy Women's Day to everybody <laughs> and celebrating all the women here in, in green infrastructure and making it happen. I very much appreciate that. In all honesty, the, uh, it's, it's, it very much seems that the, the future is female, judging by the, the ratios in, this, in the classes that I've been teaching. So I very much appreciate and celebrate that. And I'm hoping that, you know, maybe some of my male counterparts will, will step it up and start, and start joining, the, uh, joining the revolution. But I very much appreciate um, <clears throat> and have, have appreciated meeting and appreciate working with the, uh, the heavy female population in green infrastructure. So happy Women's Day, everybody. And we will just uh, jump back into where we left off. Like I said, we will just get through this today. We are cranking through this. So you're definitely gonna, gonna have to find something to keep us going potentially on the last day. Um, so in discuss, we're just, we were discussing bioswales, bioretention cells, uh, et cetera. Um, we are on inlets and types of inlets. So types of inlets, we have catch basins, dispersed sheet flows, uh, curve cuts and trench drains. <clears throat> Pre-settling is a huge thing. It is something that I focus a lot on that um, I feel gets a little overlooked. But when you are capturing and handling stormwater, uh, especially if you're taking it off a right away and or a parking lot, you are going to be dealing with trash. You are going to be dealing with sand and other sediment and silt that will be making it your way. And those will absolutely doom the, uh, the longevity of your bioswale if you do not control them and handle them properly. Now, being able to do this isn't really a hard thing, but it needs to be thought out. And I'm going to go into that a little as we go through this, um, because some of the go-to low-hanging fruits um, are not necessarily the most, uh, the most practical or responsible ways to, uh, to handle this. <clears throat> so the, uh, the pre-settling, the idea behind it, is to steal the velocity of the water, which I've talked about. 
um, and disperse that water so it will enter at a, at a reasonable rate and um, evenly throughout the system. <clears throat> we have uh, for ponding areas, etc. We have the, the side slopes, rocky walls. So this is all how we can create our, our basins and the different types of basins. So, you know, normally for your, um, for your vegetated swale, your bioswale, uh, more often than not, you want to have those gently sloping sides. Uh, it's aesthetically pleasing, easily accessible, easy to maintain, um, etc. The rocky walls is if you have, you know, definite severe grade change that you need to deal with, or if you are infiltrating a whole lot of water in a in a more natural setting, etc. Than the rocky walls or the vertical walls, and when we're talking tree trenches um, and the like. <clears throat> The bioretention soil mix allows water to soak in rapidly. It treats the runoff and it supports healthy plant growth. So, I mean, every, every state has its own mix. Like I said, I'm not a huge fan of Massachusetts. I am a growing fan of the recent release by UNH. <clears throat> um, I, thought theirs, I thought theirs was great. I think Mass has a little too much compost in theirs. Um, and that, that will lead to um, high nutrient loads, at least in the beginning while that compost continues to, to break down. Under drains are the option, but under drains, as I've been kind of trumpeting, um, are, are a way to marry green and gray um, and are an, a relatively, seemingly at least on paper, easy way to um, connect that filter water and et cetera to, to the existing stormwater systems, uh, as well as having overflows in there for backup. Uh, the under drain system in like the, the top example there uh, is great if the system gets overwhelmed and the water is not able to infiltrate into the native soils quickly enough, it will go through the perforated pipe, get picked up, and uh, and head out after it has already gone through all of the uh, all of the filtration, <clears throat> and then in a lined system, well, then all the water that is gathered uh, in that system ultimately will make its way uh, out out the under drain, <clears throat> and you and you will uh, be able to have that in any sort of confined system aside from, I guess, like a rubber liner, but for instance, this vault, there needs to be a small drain because what will happen is you need about, you need that under drain about six inches up from the base uh, of the vault. And what that will mean is you will have that, that water, if it's just in gravel, <clears throat> has no way to move via capillary action up through the soil. So you, you run the risk of creating an anaerobic condition at the base of the vault. Um, so if you do not have some sort of a slight drain or something put in there uh, so that any remaining water can pour out, it's very similar to if you put a catch basin at the bottom of a downspout, it's important to drill some small holes in there so that last little quarter inch or half inch of water that's left in there uh, can make its way out. In the catch basins case, it's so you don't get mosquitoes. In this case, you don't want to create an anaerobic condition uh, at the base of your, of your confined structure. <clears throat> so Trevor, what were you suggesting below the un under drain, if the under drain is- Having was... some sort of a, just a hole, even if it's like a, a half inch, quarter inch PVC pipe or something, just a drain at the bottom. So as, as that fills up at the end, you'll have say, you know, 10 gallons, 20 gallons of water left in there that can just slowly drain out. It gives the water some place to go. Uh, a system that I did for a, a condo complex actually used what we can call, if you think of um, the, the 
plastic pallets, like pallets that things are delivered on, goods are delivered mm -hmm. on, and how they have the little feet. Or if you think of like an egg carton, um, what I did was I used a egg carton type um, plastic piece at the bottom of, of the entire planter and then put all the media into that so that there was always some soil in contact with the with the water storage reservoir so that the it could constantly pull up the any water that was left over via capillary action as that surface dried out it would pull all the water that was in the reservoir up because uh, it was a totally closed reservoir but what happened was i had some soil that was always in contact with that with that storage area so that it so that it could pull um there are multiple ways to do that when we get into green roofs if you if you use um mineral wool um or you know some sort of a filter fabric like that a bio retention or, or a retention fleece if you have something like that in a container that will between between the um say the gravel and the reservoir that will also pull pull the water up through if you don't want to have the soil in contact. So like I said, I was using something that was very similar to an egg crate um, where some of the cells had little holes in them so the water could constantly seep back in. But you don't want to create an anaerobic condition at the bottom of your closed planter, which is a piece that gets, like I said, things that just get overlooked. <clears throat> Geotextile. Uh, is it is an optional thing, but as I said, we never want to have geotextile unless we do not want contact with the soil. So in this top picture, if we do not want, say we're working in um, toxic soils, uh, brownfield situation or something like that, and we do not want to have any excessive leaching of the uh, pollutants that are in that soil, then you would line your bioretention cell with geotextile and or rubber, but let's just say geotextile to slow the amount of water that actually makes its way in. However, in if you underline the entire basin with geotextile, it will get clogged. Not might, it will. Happens all the time, gets specked all the time. It gets specked to, uh, geotextile gets specked um, to separate the layers of the planting media and the gravel to keep the two separated. Ultimately, what happens is that fabric will get clogged. So my suggestion and what I always use is either, um, I usually use a, say my gravel is one and a half, I go to three quarter, then three eighths. And then sometimes I even go down to a number nine. So I keep grades of gravel in between my my soil and my my ultimate water storage in the gravel i don't use a geotextile like that because it will get clogged i will use geotextile in situations like you can see in the lower um, on the sides <clears throat> i i use geotextile for dry wells bioswales or anything like that anytime i don't want the native soils mixing with my gravel so let's just say in a dry well situation i don't want my dry well area that may get fully inundated with water to have all the sediment kind of start to make its way out from the side native soils and clog the pores of my water storage area. So I will use to, pr to protect the sides and to keep those, um, those sediments out uh, of, my, of my gravel storage areas. I will use um, a geotextile on the sides of don't ever line because more often than not, like I, I think I gave the example before, you know, you you, come, you show up, a, a rain garden, bioswale, whatever it is, has failed. Chances are the whole thing was lined with geotextile and it usually takes about two years or so to fully clog. And then the whole thing just kind of becomes a bathtub. And again, people are wondering, you know, what to do and how did it happen, et cetera. If you dig down enough, you're going to find that fabric and you're going to find that fabric's totally clogged. So all you can either do is punch holes in the fabric or you have to remove the whole thing and start again. Depending on the size of the system and how much water you're infiltrating, sometimes slashing the fabric will work. Other times you really do have to pull the whole thing out. So personally, not for the test, but you know, 
you don't want to put it on the bottom. The sides are okay. <clears throat> and personally, my I use grades of gravel and stone to separate my layers rather than putting fabric through there. Plants, plants are probably the most important next to the soil. Plants are the most important um, portion of a bioswale or bioretention cell. They perform so much of the of the transferring the water. They perform a massive amount of filtration, uh, and they prov they provide or they sustain all of the life that is in the soil. As we talked about through photosynthesis, plants put exudates or sugars into the soil. Those sugars in the soil feed the life in the soil. The more types of plants, the more root depths you have, the more areas of the soil those sugars are getting pumped to, the healthier your soil, the more soil aggregates you have, the less compacted it is. And the more you have these little soil aggregates, the more soil aggregates you have, the more water storage you have, the more water storage you have, the more resilient green infrastructure bioswale facility you have because you, you'll have plenty of stored water to keep it going in between rain events you'll have plenty of water to support all the life within the soil and all that life within the soil along with the plant roots is taking up and breaking down the different pollutants and things that wash their way in so it, it's all nature and all we need to do is just set the stage and let nature do its thing and we just have to trust uh, trust in that. But that being said, we can't just haphazardly throw plants in like they're a decoration. They're not. They are a huge functioning portion of this. And when we get like way deep into this, first we just have to start getting these in. But then when we do start doing like, you know, bioswales the next generation, that's when I would like to start introducing, you know, specific soils designed for specific nutrients and specific plants using phytoremediation and using the plants to lock up the metals, using the plants to lock up specific toxins. So you can say, all right, well, we are on this parking lot. The amount of, you know, copper, zinc, and, and things that are found in tires, we're going to have that heavy metal load. We're going to have a salt load. We're going to have, you know, the microplastic load. We're going to have a fluorocarbon load. So you, you design your plants in your soils to handle those specific nutrients. Whereas if you were doing like a sidewalk, you could design your soil to handle something else <clears throat> and you wouldn't necessarily need. I don't know, there, I don't believe that we should have a one size fits all soil since every, every situation is different. But again, where this gets cool is the plants that you put in could help disperse and mitigate the nutrient loads or the toxin loads that enter your system. So when we were talking about longevity of a system, that's how you really achieve longevity of a system is you get the system to clean itself. So now you have this essentially a self-cleaning system that does involve maintaining the plant material, et cetera, but you, you don't have to worry about, you know, the nutrient loads of that soil getting too heavy if you are able to, you know, create those bonds to lock it up on a, in a chemical way and have the plants take them up. So. It was a little a little deep dive into it, but that's that's where this can go, which is again what I find so cool. So the plants improve the water flow with their root penetration, roots at different depths, they open up the soil, they allow that water to go, they promote the organisms, like I said, through the exudates, which also then um, provides soil structure because all of that builds the aggregates that we need. We have um, evapotranspiration. So, you know, the, the plants will take up the water and release that water through their leaves into the air, which is great for cooling the air for the heat island effect. It's for the short water cycle. So when you're talking microclimates and you're talking your immediate area, maintaining that short water cycle by increasing the, the green space is huge. It provides habitat for insects and birds, key and creates a more pleasing aesthetic through biophilia. You make people happy, you make insects and animals happy, you have healthy soil, you have healthy hydrology. It's a win, 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 win all the way around. <clears throat> this is something, this is where um, I tend to 
diverge a little bit from the class from just, and this is just personal experience. There are some, uh, some cases where this does apply, but it is um, considering when you are planting a bioswale or a rain garden, you want to consider the moisture zones and plant plants that do not mind being wet for an extended period of time at the bottom and reduce that going up and the plants at the top of your bioswale should be drought tolerant. I advocate for just planting your bioswales and rain gardens with your favorite native perennials. Uh, if your bioswale is draining right, then it, there will not be any standing water or extended time to, if the soils are saturated uh, to hurt even a drought tolerant plant. And all in all, your bioswale is going to be dry more than it's going to be wet and even sedums and those type plants that uh, survive and thrive in the driest of conditions can be absolutely inundated with water for a 24 hour period. This all being said, if you had a, um, if you are infiltrating a whole lot of water or you have an exceptionally deep bioswale where the, the basin will remain moist long after the storm, uh, and those water, the soil, soil could remain saturated long after the storm, then yes. Um, but for the most part, the majority of basins and swales that I see, you do not. And we have to remember that it doesn't rain every day. So those are going to be dry more often than they're going to be wet. <clears throat> uh, you need to uh, maintain sight lines and setbacks along along roadways. And again, that comes to planting. You want to plant to make, make them easy to keep in line, to maintain those sight lines and to maintain those setbacks. <clears throat> make them accessible. Uh, for instance, like along sidewalks, you don't want things that are gonna grow out and cut down on the sidewalk. So again, that comes with the planting plan and the maintenance plan. Um, visual buffering, aesthetics and salt tolerance are all things that you need to consider. And those all come down with the planting plan and the maintenance plan. Because if you plant plants that can take salt, then that will also help. Berms and check dams. These are ways to control the flow of water through the bioswale. Again, something that, it, it's something that you don't think of, but it is very important. Because if you have a whole lot of water, if I have 500 gallons coming in on the front end, that 500 gallons is going to move its way through. The more I can slow it down, the more it's going to infiltrate. If I divide it into say two, three sections, that first section is going to fill and it may be a small rain event, it's only the first section. And all that water will infiltrate there. And all those, those roots and those microbes will handle that. But if that gets full, well, then it'll spill over into the next section and start being handled over there. Again, this is why you should just plant yourself a drought tolerant piece because the final section may not see water on, you know, unless you have a, an extreme rain event or a multi-day rain event. But types of check dams and berms to slow and control the water. We have earthen berms where we have a bowl and then the water would have to come up and over the earth. And then you have another bowl we have rock berms, which are would be which would be stacked rock rock walls or gabion baskets, concrete berms for a more constructed area, which would have notches and or cutouts for the water to spill through once the water got high, and then wood berms for natural um, natural areas. Catch basins and overflow structures. Um, can be used to step down from one bioretention swale to the next lower swale. Again, those need to be set at or just above the ponding depth, not at the very bottom of the basin. I told you that's my, it drives me crazy. It's my pet peeve. Here we have unsecured materials in a rainstorm that are going to go washing across the parking lot into the storm drain and into the actual uh, biosystem itself. Everything that I've just been telling you about, now they have a, a 
whole picture of it where it hasn't been handled. And this is the, exactly what you need to watch, watch out for is during construction or even during general maintenance, materials got delivered, rain day, and then what? So now your mulch is washing all over the parking lot. So you're losing the mulch or it's going to uh, clog the, uh, you know, it's not supposed to be in those inlets and in that gravel. And if it starts washing into that gravel, well, now you've clogged your inlet. So like this picture is the perfect example of what not to do. Types of overflows. <clears throat> a low spot in an earthen rim, more like a rain garden, is just the low spot for that water to come out. Now you have to understand that when the water is going out of an uh, overflow, whether it be a low spot or a pipe, that water, for the most part, is just gently rising and just kind of trickling. If it's a if it's a rain garden and there's a low spot, it's just trickling out. It's not. It shouldn't be heavy flowing out if you've built your rain garden right. For the most part, it should just barely trickle out the back end and should just barely be going down that pipe, uh, barring certain rain events, which if it's extreme, if an extreme event, then uh, you might get it pouring out. <clears throat> Cat's basin, vertical stand pipes, horizontal pipes, curb cut overflows, which we talked about in the, uh, in the bulb outs, in the vegetated uh, extensions where you just have a cut at the other end. So it would go in one side and out, out the back end. And this all can be connected to an underdrain system. When designing the overflow, and again, this comes down to understanding what you are installing. <clears throat> Does the overflow elevation provide the proper ponding depth? Is the overflow elevation higher than the discharge point elevation. Are check dams needed to slow the velocity? Does the downstream flow path <clears throat> um, drain to open areas where no water damage can occur? That's like in the, in the course of a rain garden, if it does kind of come out and start backing out or overflowing naturally the low spot, if the water starts moving out of there, is it going to uh, affect anything downstream or on the other side is the downstream flow path clear. So here we have a bioswale in a parking lot. So it's collecting that sheet flow. That sheet flow is all making its way into the system from this relatively long um, bioswale. So to make sure that it doesn't all fill up all at once, you have all these check dams through there to help kind of hold that water, infiltrate some of that water and slow the velocity. And then in the foreground, you have the overflow, which is set at the, uh, the ponding depth. So we have the, um, <clears throat> the elevations for a bioretention cell. So this one here is, you know, full of, you know, Nice river rock stone could also be riprap if we did not want it to be so pretty. Um, but the, the key here is making sure that all of that doesn't get clogged with mulch or sediment, etc. <clears throat> Trevor, can you talk a little bit about mulch? Because I've I've seen rain garden examples where the mulch just floats if there's ponding. So is it good to specify like shredded bark mulch or hardwood or what, what do you recommend when you specify so mulches? So I will, I use, usually use a leaf mold mulch depending because sometimes that can add a high nutrient load. Um, mm -hmm. Oftentimes I will use uh, like a, a, a triple grind mulch or uh, a decomposed wood chip as well but if you have like two like two chippy mulch if you use like standard wood chip mulch which pretty much like they looks like they used you run it in ponding it's going to float um no matter what mulch you use unless you're using stone um if it ponds enough there's going to be some floating and that would then be part of the maintenance would then be to kind of correct where all that mulch then settled once it drained. 
you need to you need to fix some of that <clears throat> um, but I've often used if I can get a good one with you know that's not going to affect the nutrients too much I've used a leaf mulch I'll use uh, wood chips like I said decomposed wood chips uh, I'm a big fan of or a triple grind if you can get it usually doesn't float away but like your standard residential wood mulch will just float like crazy and end up clogging clogging you know areas of your uh, of your retention cell thanks um so this is just a list of elevations to uh, elevations and things to consider um i have a quick question go ahead um it, it might be just that I've never looked for it, but where does a person find triple uh, grind mulch? Would that be at the farmer supply, like the rest of it, or? It's harder. To, it's 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 harder. I've found it harder to find. Um, so you do have to kind of go on a hunt because it really isn't. I I can't say a regular supplier. Okay. That, that I've been able to find. Um, mm -hmm. You know, last time I found it was a job that I was doing in New York. Oh, okay. Uh, I, I found a new. I found a. A, a New York um, supplier who somebody who had it, but it, it is and it may it may be something that you can um, request for a project. Uh, but I find Arborist Ramil mulch is another one. Uh, it's a it's just it's that's a good one. It's expensive, um, great great to use. Again, it comes down to how decomposed it is because you don't want to be nutrient loading, but it's great because it doesn't float just like the leaf mulch doesn't float. Um, I tend to, I, I don't use stone as a mulch. It's a pain to clean um, for starters because it, since it's not going to go anywhere, you would then have to take, always clean the sediment and stuff out of it. It also um, keeps this, the soil warmer in many cases than I, than I want it to be. Um, which isn't great for the plant life. The idea of the mulch is to regulate the soil temperature and the stones end up kind of warming and creating kind of false environments uh, within the root zones uh, and in the, in the system itself. Uh, it can be used and there are certain situations where it's fine, but I think filling your entire system with stone is just not the way to go. Great, thanks. You got it. Um, here you can see we have the water coming in upstream, moving its way down over check dams down to the down to the uh, to the drain. We have severe compaction around the trees and on the street. Uh, on the I mean on the the, the curb side, um, but we have the existing roadway as for the for the elevation the overflow right there. We have the. Um, <clears throat> The drains, the check dam, so each each section can fill and drain, uh, and it's the whole thing is pitched and designed to to move down ultimately, so it can leave. We do not want so that the check dams have to be set to keep the water moving through the system. They can't be all set at the same height, um, or you'll end up getting a backup and it'll just flow back onto the street. And now we get into the tree trenches for the earlier discussion. Um, and it comes down to silver cells. It's come down, it comes down to, and as I said before, it's better to plant 200 trees properly than it is to put 500 trees in. And so if we can set our trees up, trees really start, they don't really make a difference until they get much of a difference until they get older, until they get established, until you get a good canopy, until they can cast shade. When they're only like, you know, six, six, ten feet tall, you know, they're performing a service, but it's when they get to be like 30 feet tall um, that they really, they really go to town and they really start making a difference. So we need to set our trees up so that they will reach that age. Uh, we need to set our trees up and, and expect that them to be where we planted them, you know, 30 plus years later. <clears throat> so silver cells are structural supports that will create uh, that soil volume. There are other 
um, structures that have been created. Silva cell is just the one that we're talking about here. Subsurface modular support to provide adequate uncompacted soil volume so that trees can grow. The trench area can extend from the planting area under sidewalks and roadways. Um, a typical, we have the typical tree, the tree trench or tree pit size and how that can then be extended if we use silva cells and support and how we can move water then through the system. Sizing determined um, by the soil or the structural needs for adequate root volume of the tree. So it kind of depends on the tree you're planting, but you want one to three cubic feet of soil per one cubic foot of tree crown. So your best bet then, if you're to follow that volume, would be to ask yourself what you want your tree crown to be. Not what it is going in, but what it is when the tree is mature. <clears throat> Here's just a section. This just shows the water moving, moving through the system, saturating the soils uh, in, the, in the, tree, uh, the tree pit area extra water just moving out. This is a better, this I find is a great example or a much better example. And you can see that sidewalk. So we have that tree trench going all the way down between the sidewalk or the sidewalk and the street. Or if you had a bike lane on one side, the, the tree trench, and then a sidewalk on the other side, and then the street all the way on the outside, you could filter all that water you know, from the street under the bike lane, into the tree trench, you have all those trees and underneath that sidewalk and or underneath the bike lane as well, depends on what you're doing, you could have that soil volume and you'd have that area would then get saturated. The water would move out through the soil and that tree could really expand. And then of course, we always want to have some sort of an overflow or a drain pipe, just in case, depending on storms, hurricanes, et cetera, we don't want to create an anaerobic environment and have nowhere for that water to go should this get inundated. So there does, there does need to be an overflow planned into the system, but with that massive amount of soil volume, you can think about how much, um, how much water that that can take up. And with that massive amount of soil volume, you actually run, run the risk of having a tree that lasts 30, 40 years or more. You know, trees can live hundreds of years, so, but we can't really get street trees to get past year eight. So if we start planning for 30, 40 years on a tree, we'll be in great shape because those trees will be slowing that rainwater, they'll be cooling our environment, and they'll be drawing down carbon like they should. Hey, Trevor. Yes. Just uh, back to that diagram. With number seven, is what I'm seeing a kind of scaffolding underneath the sidewalk or road that holds it up That's so that the, the soil is not that, supporting it? That's the silva cell that we're talking about. Okay. So it's a, it's a, it's a modular plastic system, which you can see right here, mm -hmm. that, that all gets installed. So you, you have that compacted gravel, you build this plastic system over it, then you fill that with your bioretention soil, et cetera. And then you are going to build on top of that your sidewalk. So it's got a, it's got a top and a bottom. And as you can see here on that top, you just build, that's where you can build your whole sidewalk area. And you can have permeable pavers on top so that water can make its way down too. But it's strong enough to support the, side, the, the weight of the sidewalk and all that's needed there. So it provides that void space. How's the frost, how's the frost gonna affect that? Because I mean, obviously it's gonna be wet. So if the frost gets in there, it's really gonna push the sidewalk or whatever's above it. Um, so you have, you install a permeable system of it. 
that you will not be trapping too much water directly under the pavers. Uh, you will have water in the soil structure, but if you are to install, say, a, a bioretention soil, which will also be, you know, drain relatively quickly, you are, or, you know, at a, at a relative rate, you don't want anything with a lot of clay to hold that water, you're still not trapping that much water, say, in the system. Um, and with the silva cells, you should not, should not. In an, in an extreme situation, and I just haven't seen it, but you should not, uh, the whole system shouldn't lift like that. And how deep is it? Is it below the, fro the frost-free zone? Like if you go back to the other slide, I'm just trying to remember what that. Well, that's, that's not really giving you the depth. Yeah. You know, here, here you're talking about uh, like three, three, four feet deep. Now out by you, I mean, I don't know where the frost line is by you. Nothing freezes out here anymore. So I don't even consider frost lines. Uh, you know, the, 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 same is, the same as you would. Um, so, but I would, I would, especially in an urban environment, like if I'm in Springfield, I feel like you got this all day. Um, just because, you know, the way, the, way that would, the way that would all work. In a, you know, in a different area, you know, possibly not. But I would say like Worcester Springfield in an urban environment, this could absolutely work because they're going they're gonna to run warmer anyway. Uh, and you just, I think if you dig down and design for that, again, that will increase the cost of the project exponentially. It's what is that tree worth? You know, and so you have to start doing the, you know, doing the value of a, of a street tree, you know, over, over the course of years. But I have not seen nor heard of a situation where this has, um, has failed due to frost. Um, right. another, another question related, um, I understand that permeable pavers are the preferred. Um, is there anything that's an option if we don't use permeable pavers for trees, just because as we had noted before, we do need like the extra equipment. So may not be something that we could do right now. Um, to maintain the permeable pavers. Like, so if we put in just a concrete sidewalk, is there a way of, a similar way of doing things that we could protect the trees? Are we talking about, you're putting in a concrete sidewalk, yep. no permeable pavers, but you're doing like an, ex an extended soil volume like this? Yeah. So you're gonna, mm -hmm. dig, you're gonna dig it out and put the soil volume in like this and not have you but you won't that's what i'm wondering is if, if there's a way of putting these putting trees in um this is with permeable pavers with you know just regular concrete sidewalks it sounds like it's not a good option to me well for, say for instance here mm -hmm. this is standard concrete sidewalk yep here's your here's your tree grate and then you have the permeables on either side right but um, i mean it, it's the maintenance thing that i'm worried about right. so then you would have, have to put in you would have to put in you know, some sort of sidewalk drain. Okay. You know, if you didn't want to put in, you know, put in all those permeables, you need some way for the water to get in there. This, yep. this right here, you know, isn't necessarily going to do it. Right. You know, if there isn't, you know, this works because this, these, these pavers here and these pavers here, that's all silver cell. So really what you have is this five by five, um tree grid but then you have like another you know five by eight section on either side yep you know, with those pavers yep so yes it can work you just have to get creative you have to figure out where's the water going because there's really so now we're talking about we have the longevity of the tree but if so here's the thing in this case we're talking about just the longevity of the tree from what you and I are talking about. You, we're not talking about the tree as stormwater management. So you're, we're not filtering any excess water to this tree. We're just talking about building tree pits for the life of a tree, which are kind of two different things. Okay, yeah, definitely. You see what I'm saying? Yep. So, I mean, like you could have here, you could have a curb cut or you could have a standpipe like the uh, the tree box filter type deal, where the where the water comes in, fills a chamber, 
and then flows into the tree box. Or in what you're saying, then no, you don't have to have permeable pavers. You just need to make sure that tree is going to get water. So, if, I mean, if we have, if you if the runoff's going to all go in here, then great. And if you're going to have, but you, what you run the risk of is like the soil out here, if no water can get to it, and it's not like picking up any water from the street or anything else, then that's just going to be dry. No, exactly. That's why I just didn't know if there was another way of looking at it. Um, so you need, you need little tiny, little tiny metal ports all in here to make yeah. sure that that sidewalk water is going to get in there. See what I'm saying? Yep. Right. Yeah. It's, it, that to do that to achieve what you're saying isn't hard. You just gotta you gotta get creative with it to, to you know to make sure that it'll work. You know. So here you have all the water, the sheet flow coming off of the sidewalk. Plus you have these permeable spaces. And these permeable spaces have the probably have this like the silver cells under them, or that water's just coming through and making its way into this giant tree trench. And then at the base, of course, you have the the underdrain. But the thing is, that, like if you have a tree with a thirty foot canopy, and it's only got you know, and the on either side it's got ten feet of sidewalk then it's, it's really not the idea of the canopy. Like we said, the water is supposed to travel the, through the canopy and make its way into the root zone. So we can have that big root zone, but if there's no way for the water to get to that root zone, we haven't, we, we haven't accomplished enough. We have the, then we have the soil volume, but if it's dry, then it's not gonna, it's not gonna help. Uh, <clears throat> setbacks for infiltration of stormwater will vary by location. You guys are the municipality, so I would consult you. <clears throat> we need to have setbacks from utilities. We need to be aware of utilities, and we do not want excess water, ponding, or freezing around utilities. Um, however, if we are to install bio, some sort of a bow retention cell within the vicinity, especially in an urban area, we will have to be working around utilities then we need to do something to di either divert the water, protect the utility, um, et cetera. Um, construction sequence, this is just letting you know that when you are working in a hyper urban environment, that there is a lot to consider when installing green infrastructure rather than a suburban area have a construction sequence plan, pre-construction meetings to get everybody on the same page, prevent over, com over compaction, using smaller, lighter machines, and plan on how to create creatively get in there. For instance, I mean, they have this truck kind of conveying the soil down there. Blower trucks are what we've used often. That way we can keep the truck on pavement away and just be able to blow the soil uh, or media, whatever it is, in <clears throat> operation equipment adjacent to and not in the facility. If you must be in the facility, use lightweight equipment with uh, low contact pressure. Confirm component elevations to ensure water flows through the facility properly. Cover your stockpiled materials with plastic or mulch, <clears throat> plant extended uh, stockpiled materials with grasses, clean equipment to prevent mixing of materials, install silt fencing around the materials and around the, the system to keep, uh, to prevent from the mixing. So here is just a construction sequence in phase one. Uh, if you are an inspector, um, what you are going to do and what you are going to look for. You are going to check the native soils to make sure they're comparable to the design spec. You are going to make sure that the erosion control is in place. Check the grading to make sure that the grading is on track to be graded properly. 
I'm big on the photo documentation. I have the phone with the extended, ex everything extended memory so that I can have lots and lots of photos on there. Um, bear pri proper subgrade elevations, <clears throat> that the soils are not compacted and will infiltrate properly. Again, on two, as we move along, make sure the erosion control is in place. Make sure that the grading is all going according to plan. Make sure the underdrain and the, and the overflows are set at their proper elevations. Verify the, the bedding uh, and the filter materials. Make sure they meet specification. Visit number three, you're gonna check the mix to make sure the mix was mixed to proper spec. Check the, uh, the lab report on the mix. Make sure that the mix is spread at the proper depths. Make sure that the erosion control is in place. You can check the depth of the mix with a shovel or a rod to make sure that it is spread properly. <clears throat> Your second to final visit. <clears throat> Make sure that the areas, the, the contributing area is stabilized. You see how they have the sandbags on the inlets. That's because we do not want street runoff coming into our system before we are cleaned, planted, and ready to go. Verify ponding depths once everything is in and all the soils are spread and everything like that. <clears throat> Verify the plant density and plant health and the mulch depth. Make sure that the inlets and the overflows are correct. And then on the final visit, you can remove the erosion control and make sure that you have O&M in place. Bioswale O&M is pretty easy to create a checklist. You know, I do all the plants that I put in there and what they look like. So anybody can look at it and then you can look at a plant, look at the leaf and look at the flower and everything. And if it doesn't look like that, then it doesn't belong in there. And then I have planting or pruning plans, etc., whatever the maintenance might be set up seasonally. During all of construction, you want to call before you dig. You want to have a traffic and pedestrian plan, especially in these right-of-way constructions. Protect the utilities. Follow standard uh, safety when working with, with vehicles and understand the critical root zone of the existing vegetation and have an arborist protect those trees. For rain gardens, the tools you will need. So there are like questions in here, what tools are needed for rain garden construction or bioswale construction? Rain gardens are very simple. You may or may not need a mini X. Um, rain garden soil or amendments, again, you're usually dealing with native soils. You can just use a a level, a level and a two by four to make sure that you are level all the way across. And then you just design where you want your overflow. Hand tamp for compacting berms and a pipe for inflow if needed. So if you are running a downspout, you know, over that is going to daylight in the rain garden, then you will have that. Special tools for bioswales, <clears throat> vacuum excavation truck, concrete cutting, excavator, loader, uh, con concrete uh, contractor for the curb cuts, landscape contractor for with rock wall expertise, extensive hand tools. <clears throat> when you're dealing with tree trenches, you're going to need uh, trench boxes, etc. Maybe a crane or a boom truck if you're dealing with the concrete vaults. Uh, unless you're doing like a pour in place, but if you're going to lower the concrete vault in, you're going to need the crane and you're going to need to make sure you do, like I said, tree trenches for excavation safety. Infiltration testing, determine and verify the, the subgrade to make sure it drains as you think it will and that you don't find yourself on top of a swath of clay. <clears throat> if the bioretention area is, is not draining as planned. 
then you will need to either amend the soil conditions or amend the plan. Small scale pit infiltration test. This is definitely, this is, you know, for a, for a, uh, for a larger system. I mean, a small scale pit, but this is not for your rain garden. Um, so you want to dig down. So you have at least the top three, if not top four soil horizons. You want to make sure that you have a 12 to 32 square foot bottom area of your trench, of your, of your pit. You want to make sure that the soil is set back two feet and that your sides are sloped. You are going to then fill that pit um, to the desired depth with water and allow it to drain. And then you are going to fill it again and time how long it takes to drain. You fill it the first time to saturate the surrounding soils. And then you fill it again to see how well it drains once those soils are fully saturated. Uh, over excavate pit, uh, pit bottom to check for hydraulic restrict restrictive layers like bedrock in the groundwater depth. And you, it's good to just monitor the if you have the option to know what that groundwater is going to be that fluctuation is going to be through the uh through the off season so you can dig test pits to monitor what that water is going to be <clears throat> do your pit test between december 1st and april 1st um, recommend one pit test per bio -reten retention site or every 5,000 square feet. For long sites, every 200 linear feet. Record the results on a field sheet. Review corrective fact factors to adjust for a site variability and reduction of the system infiltration capability over time compared to designed rates. Is that testing the bioretention test, soil. Is that um, test uh, between December 1st and April 1, is that correct for the Northeast? I've, I've actually posed that question and there, the answer was yes, but mm -hmm. I feel like ours should extend a little, little further out. Yeah. For okay. this test, that's what you need to know. That um, date. okay. You know, I, I, it's one of the things in this that I question. There are certain things in this that I question. Okay. Or that I feel, you know, I feel because I know this is supposed to hit the, the whole country. So I don't necessarily know exactly why they picked those dates because I would think that would really change like if you're up in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I'm, I'm, 100%, I'm not 100% sure why they set those dates. Okay. Good Except that that that's kind of where the, your your groundwater, you know, should be at its at its max. I mean, I don't know. I don't. I, I said, like I said, I I didn't get an answer. It was one of those questions I posed, but the people who handle all of this aren't the people who came up with it. You know, there were thirteen municipalities that got together and and came up with all of this, and I don't know how they came up with that date. I was actually kind of hoping somebody on here could tell me that, but okay. <laughs> um, observe the facility during when you, so if you want to know that it's working properly, you know, observe the facility dur during a storm event. I spend much of my time out in the rain, um, checking out facilities, checking out um, just water moving through, you know, through the area helps me understand. Arlington is a very hilly town and usually when we have heavy storm events, it just peels back the asphalt. So oftentimes I am found out in the rain running around taking pictures of storm damage and trying to think of ways that we could uh, mitigate some of those problems. <clears throat> 
Uh, single ring infiltration test can be used one, upon completed. Flood test would be to flood the system and then watch how it drains after that. Test the compaction to, cor to correlate with infiltration for rain gardens um, with a penetrometer. O&M, here we go. This is the part that everybody, that everybody hates, but it's really not that hard. What it is though, is it is more landscaping landscape maintenance than it is pipe and pipe and vault maintenance so typical equipment needed for uh, uh, operations and maintenance the landscape equipment you're going to need bark blowers and trimmers and uh, hand tamp push broom pruners loppers etc for watering you're going to need soaker hoses with wands, sprinklers, tree bags, buckets, keys to the irrigation box, <clears throat> and a water source. Landscaping plants, stakes and ties, mulch, arbors, wood chip mulch, coarse compost, <clears throat> compost mulch, or rock mulch. And bioretention soil per design. Erosion control, rocker cobbles for the for, for the inlets, erosion control matting, pipe inspection. You're going to need hand tools, wrench, flashlight, mirror, garden hose, plumbing snake, measuring tape. Just be familiar with so when you get a multiple choice question on typical tools needed you know, for bioretention. You don't need to memorize all this. I don't use half these tools. Just have a general idea um, pre-testing what tools are, are needed. Specialized tools, <clears throat> factor truck, mini excavator, seed broadcaster, soil monitoring equipment, flame weeder, which is my favorite. I use that for many things. Uh, water jetter root saw for clearing under drains. Equipment for infiltration testing. Routine maintenance, remove trash and debris, remove unwanted vegetation, prune and tr trim desirable vegetation as needed to maintain sight lines. Remove any sediment or vegetation accumulated in the inlet. Check for erosion and sediment accumulation in the ponding areas. That's where you'll know like if all your mulch floats and floats there. You may need to either change your mulch or may need to figure out why you're ponding so much. Add mulch if necessary to maintain a two to three inch depth. Water during drought periods, clean, clean matted vegetation on facility bottom. So here's just a maintenance assessment. Standing water for two, three days, we have clogged media. Subgrade soil isn't, dra isn't draining properly, or your under, under drain or outlet are not working properly. Dying or dead edge of dead vegetation, too little water, too much water, incorrect plant selection, salt or other pollutants. Erosion, check your flow velocities. Check your grades. Excessive sediment, you have an unstable contributing area. Was there street construction? Did they, were they working on gas lines? Is there house construction or construction up the street? Landscape construction up the street? Where they were just dumping soil all over the street or running with their trucks in and out and just um, polluting, you know, polluting the street, which then made its way down to your, your bioswale. Uh, damage to curbs. Vehicle damage potentially due to poor edge restraints. Barrier collapse, soil compaction, trampled plants is usually due to pedestrian traffic. Inflow not spreading across the bottom. Your infiltration is too high at, at the inlet. The you have channelization or compacted soils shortcutting through the underdrains. Identifying improper operation. So this is failed 
failed bioretention area. When you have compaction and parking and no sort of vegetated strip or anything uh, leading up to it, all that water is just going to wash all that mulch down, especially the more compacted it gets with the parking on the edge. What works is when you have a vegetated strip that can start to slow the water <clears throat> and disperse the water into the bioretention facility that nobody is driving on. Sediment buildup will limit the bioretention performance. You know, if you have this much sediment, all you can do is tear it out and start again. There's no kind of fixing that. This is a total failed system. You're not gonna kind of scoop out the rocks or the sediment. You have to like scrape it all out and start again. On the other side, we have controlled sediment, but here is where I'm saying it's not the end of the world design, but let's just say you have this amount of sediment coming down this street. Once it gets these, you know, so you have this inlet and you have these stones, but the only way to clean the sediment out of these stones is to pull them all out, scoop the sediment out and put the stones back. Depending on the size of the facility, that might be just way too much labor. That may not be practical. However, we'll see in another slide, I believe it's in this or it might be in a different one that I'll show you later. Um, once this gets full with this much sediment, the water's just gonna all just flow in. It's gonna flow right over it like it was concrete and it's just gonna flow right into the system. And then you're gonna end up getting sediment flows down in here. <laughs> here we go. So this is why I'm a big fan of a four bay because we have a whole parking area. We have all of this riprap, which is great because it prevents erosion. It slows the water down and slowly disperses the, all that water out into the system. However, if not maintained and if, if, not, if not kept in check, this whole thing is now just full of sediment. So the water just comes rushing down into the system. The only way now to fix this is to remove all of this. Well, that's an easy day. That's, that's an easy day's worth of work. That's totally lost. That makes this not practical. What you would need to do is begin to slow the water up in here and allow that sediment, all that sand from the parking lot. You see it's a parking lot. You know there's a lot of sand. In designing this, you need to design to keep all that sand up here in this first bit or even down into here, but make sure you have multiple bays then that that sand can settle out in so that somebody can show up and have this thing shoveled out in five minutes rather than taking a day plus to pull all of these stones and all of this sediment out of here. That's not gonna work. So just, it's, it's, just, it's just understanding, you know, and, and thinking a little bit more about it. Here we have an improperly stabilized inlet, but what's happening here is the water's flowing across and it's coming right down here and it's just rocketing off this and just carving this out. And then all that water's just coming and now it's just, it's, it's gonna start going the wrong way and compromise the, compromise that system. So here again, we have this proper inlet. This is great. This channelized, channels it here. It will go here, it'll overflow this berm, that's great. You know, and this, this is okay, um, depending on sediment. You know, it's not a huge, terrible area to handle. All that water comes into here, but it's definitely, either way, your sediment's gonna get captured into here and won't overflow into your system, which isn't terrible. make sure your inlet is clear and then it's not getting clogged with trash and or vegetative matter. This I like. Easy to clean with a flatty. Make sure that your inlets and outlets are plant free and don't get overwhelmed with the, with the vegetation. 
or with the debris from the vegetation. If they just get left and all this, if everything in here doesn't get maintained and this just dies and doesn't get cut back or anything, then you're gonna have a whole lot of dead debris down in here, which if it was a perennial garden, it would be perfect, but that doesn't work for a bioretention facility. You need to make sure that your, plant to, your plants get established and that you have proper coverage. <clears throat> Minimum 80% of the planting plan. The plants, the plants and the plants roots are what are going to provide erosion control on the slopes. And again, as we talked about, they are a part of the system. There to be pretty. They're, they facilitate the water infiltration, they facilitate the water dispersion, and they facilitate the well, and they and th through infiltration, evapotranspiration, and through slowing the velocity of the water through the system. Healthy plants and dead plants, pretty easy to tell. <clears throat> you know, healthy plants have good foliage, good color. And they are in season. How they sh they should they're flux they're blooming or whatever in season as they should be. Um, struggling plants are struggling plants. They look sick. They're dying, or they are out of season. Here, this I mean this inlet is just gross and totally clogged, and these plants are well overgrown. As are these plants. This is not something that you want to see. While I'm sure you have wonderful infiltration with all that root penetration, there is no way to clean out all that leaf litter until all of these things have dropped their leaves. That's heavy. There is the sight lines are totally off here, so that's dangerous. Um, you know, you don't want your plants jumping out on the sidewalk and attacking people. So this is just way too overgrown uh, and way too thick. I'm a thick planter uh, and I like to cover my entire area but that's just too much. That's just too vacant lot overgrown. So you want to have a controlled planting palette. Again, you want good visibility, both for pedestrians and for vehicle traffic. You don't want your system, especially in an urban environment, to get too overgrown. Underground inspections using closer TV to make sure that you're under drains are not full of roots or sediment. And you may need to do some drain cleaning if that, that ends up being the case. Inspection documents. So when you are, are coming and inspecting a GI facility, you want to have the history of the facility. When was it built? Um, <clears throat> you know you have the as built and the and the record drawings any easements etc location on 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 the maps site specific o and m that's the big one site specific because an o and m manual that you poached from a seattle bioswale is not going to be relevant in holyoke <clears throat> important information to have the planting plans the maintenance logs inspection forms, enforcement documents, and camera footage. So it's, I, I did this with Youth Build Boston. We maintain, you'll see this in my, my presentation that I'm about to uh, give you next time. Um, but I did with Youth Build Boston, we maintained five rain gardens for Boston Parks Department. And we had a whole checklist of, is the inlet clear? Is the outlet clear? Is there excessive sediment? Is there excessive trash? Is there signs of vandalism? We took pictures. Are there are there excessive weeds? What you know? When was the last rain event? How much rain was there? You want to have the name of the inspectors, the date of the inspection, the location, the age of the facility, size of the facility. That should just all be in there. Time since last rainfall. So if it, the last rainfall, if you're there on Friday and the last rainfall was an inch on Monday and it's still soaking wet, something's wrong quantity of last rainfall have all that in there there's just a it seems tedious it seems like a lot but here's here's the whole thing through the documentation and this is where i'm kind of big on documentation uh to a certain degree through the documentation 
while we are trying to perfect, say, the bioswale, through documentation, we can figure out easily what's working and what's not working. So the next one we built with our next MVP grant, we won't make the same mistakes twice. So that's great. Through documentation, like for instance, like when I come onto a scene, I can be like, well, who was maintaining this? Or when was the last time it was maintained? Obviously knowing that nobody's touched it for three years. But you can then see, you can then be like, well, this didn't fail because it's a bioswale. This failed because nobody's looked at it for three years because they don't even make this wrapper anymore. So I know that, you know, that the trash that's in here, this has been here for a long time. So, you know, that's, that's the, you know, that's the other way. So we can, we can see, we can figure out, you know, what's working, what's not working, what went wrong. We can identify problems, you know, before they become giant issues and become super expensive. We can also then, when we have it down, then you can say, hey, we built this. It's been working like this for five years. So somebody can contact you and say, hey, what did you do? You can be like, here's our recipe. And that's the whole thing. Because then when it's working, we know what's working. And we can pass on. We, we can tell everybody else how to do it right so they don't make the mistakes. If we made mistakes, which is going to happen, you know, if they won't make the same mistakes that we do. And it's not just in green infrastructure that mistakes get made. We have great infrastructure in the built environment and all these other things. People screw up all the time. And if we figure out when and how it happened, then it won't happen again. But with green infrastructure, at least from my end, where it's so important to prove that it's going to work, if we can tweak the mistakes along the way, and if we can then come up with the secret sauce and just give everybody the recipe so the secret sauce isn't so secret anymore, that would just be awesome because then we can have successful facilities everywhere. So having some sort of a maintenance log, having an, an O&M plan, and then actually having that recorded will allow everybody, say, in your area to just mimic that design that's, that's working perfectly in their own variation because they'll have different soils. So like I said, every single one's going to be a little different. But when you're in the general vicinity and most of your conditions are right, then you guys could you know just tweak it a little bit and know that it's working. <clears throat> For instance, in this discussion we had like the first day, building the bioswale six inches off the roadway, not necessarily successful. Build, having a, say a five foot buffer strip and having the center of the bioswale, you know, 10 feet off the roadway or so, it, it, probably you're not gonna have that same roadway problem. Okay, so that happened. Fix that and just don't do that again. Now it's been identified. Um, basic inspection list content still going site content so we have all the plans being able to check through um, how everything is doing and how it was the last time so having all those check boxes safety equipment to have when you are checking a bioretention facility boots long sleeves gloves eye protection high-vis vests traffic plan pedestrian plan utility protection pest management if needed one of the pushbacks I get for um, heavy urban environments is aren't you going to be creating habitat for rats? And we can mitigate that through um, the types of plants and how we plant and how we maintain. We can make it not a super habitable place. You know, for instance, I don't plant a thick ground cover when I'm worried about rat nesting. <clears throat> So I have not found it to be an issue on anything that I've consulted on and or you know, worked with or seen. Um, have just your general standard safety uh, precautions around hand tools, et cetera. Understand the critical root zone of the tree and respect the critical root zone. You will need to take separate safety precautions when working down in a tree trench because you will be subgrade. Visual indicators <clears throat> that your your facility is is working perfectly and it's great for it's great for um, the pedestrian and and public life. It does not interfere with anybody's sight lines. And it does not create a hazard in any way. Branches and things are not leaning into the sidewalk nor into the street that anybody has to swerve for. 
and you can see over in and around the entire facility. Maintaining a healthy facility, you wanna make sure that there is enough vegetation, 80% or greater is what you wanna be looking for to support proper facility function. Plant health may result, may be the result of soil compaction, poor plant selection, <clears throat> improper care and handling, planted too shallow, planted too deep. It's better to plant shallow than too deep. Improper watering, chemical or herbicides. Noxious weeds, again, this is why if you're gonna do an o &M manual, if you create one of these, have a picture of everything that's supposed to be in there. And if you can have that picture of that plant, what it looks like, um, say even in each season, or at least maybe in the, in the summer and in the fall, if it definitely has a, a, a look to it, that will make it real easy for somebody, even without much uh, plant experience, to know which ones, ones don't. One of the greatest things that came out of the, uh, the rain garden thing I did with Youth Build Boston was full on plant ID. You know, the young adults that I was working with, they, they came out with just for those little areas, but they were learning plant ID, they learned weed ID, along with GI facility function. So they, be, they began to know what to look for, but they also started to at least pick up on what plants were there and what plants weren't. When we first got there, they didn't know what to touch, what to tear out. By the end of the summer, because we did it for an entire summer, by the end of the summer, they knew exactly what was, you know, what shouldn't belong and they started even naming things. So um, it, was, it was great to see and it's a great skill to have. Things we need to consider, especially kind of out by you guys, this is a, a common, I would believe is a way, common way things would look. So you have, you know, you have this facility and you don't have a plan, especially if this, if that facility bumps right up to a woodland, it's going to look like that in no time. It's going to look like the lower picture in the blink of an eye. So you need to, especially because many of these things go in with plugs um, and very small plants, you need to make sure that you have, those plants are cared for during the establishment period let them get big enough you need to let that plant cover come in because what you have in the upper picture is a disturbed area of delicious soil and every seed in the world wants to be blown into that area and take hold it's got plenty of space it's got plenty of light and it's got plenty of nutrients so that is like a weed magnet so you do need to make sure that you maintain and make sure that you know the desired vegetation takes hold and will be out compete any weeds that move in. You will still then have to come in, especially in a situation like in that picture, you will still have to come in and maintain any weeds that are kind of any weed pressure. Uh, inspecting the trees for signs of disease and stress. This is best conducted by a certified arborist. That may be one of the questions. They may be, who is the best to inspect trees? Certified arborist. Um, performance flows, <clears throat> performance flows increase an extra 20%. If you have an under drain, they can move that much more water through the facility. Water quality, you want to, <clears throat> you want to reduce the suspended solid concentration. Um, the total dissolved copper, zinc are consistently reduced nitrate, total phosphorus. Um, you want to make sure there's a reduction. If you have a, if you have a way, so if you have an under drain or if you have a way to, for instance, if you have your bio facility has just say has just a gravel basin. Um, if you build in an observation port where you can take water samples, that is an, also an excellent thing to do um, <clears throat> just so you can make sure that your facility is working properly and you can also prove that your facility is working properly and be like, oh, look at this. You know, this is what the, the general reading of the street runoff is and this is what the water from our under drain or from our observation area 
is. We captured this water and look at, look at the nutrient loads and how much they've been reduced as it's made its way through our system. So building in ways to test is, is a good thing to do. <clears throat> and that does it for today. Does anybody have any questions? Are you all just super excited about bioretention and building bioswales and everything else? Whew, you guys are blowing me away with this excitement. Well, I can tell you about perk tests in Massachusetts. You can do them any time of year as long as you're below the frost line. All right. A, a cautionary note on perk tests though. Um, they're applicable for designing small septic systems. That's what they were designed for. If you're designing a much larger system, and that why I realized this is because my first job was in Florida designing as a geotechnical engineer. We worked on designs of large basins. And if you use an oversimplified analysis like a PERC test, you will significantly underestimate the area that's required to drain a, a given volume of water because it doesn't account for the groundwater mound beneath, beneath the recharging basin. It requires a much more complicated analysis. So if you upscale the size of the basin more than what you're doing in this book, you could have a potential failure. You need a much more complex analysis. No, absolutely, I agree with that. So anybody have any questions, any inspirations? Trevor, in a, a similar vein to um, what Joe and Chris were just mentioning, um, do you have a, a, a model spec? I know we're looking at this both from the main inside and then how does it get designed and even how we get support for it. Model spec for that, um, uh, those, that test pit that you mentioned? The, the pit test that was in there? That's right. I, uh, no, I do not. Okay, thanks. We'll be doing some digging anyways. No, the biggest, the biggest key and what I find is the, the often, often mistaken, that's where I was kind of agreeing with Dave is often we, we undersize or underestimate um, so th the biggest thing is I've found in, in the, in the tests that I've run is that you do want to saturate the soils. I mean, they give you the whole recipe on how the soil should be saturated in there. I just, I go through, I fill it once, let it drain, fill it again, just to, just to get a better reading. Um, and that's, that's, I find out, that's where I've found anything that I've ever done in any, any kind of looking and testing I've ever done that has pretty much kept me um, relatively, relatively safe. Um, whereas if you just do it, you know, straight through, you, you get a false, you get a false positive sometimes. Excellent. Thank you very much. All right, guys, and if you have, if you have nothing, then we are all good and we will get going tomorrow. Great. Thank you, Trevor. Thanks, right. Trevor. Thank you. Take care. Bye.